Hello. Good morning, everyone. I welcome all of you all on behalf of the Department of Defense and Strategic Studies and Center for China Analysis and Strategy for the second day of the second strategic dialogue on rise of China and its implications for the world. Very soon, we will start session one. Which is on the topic China's strategic agenda. The chairperson for this session is Professor Dr. Vijay Khare, head of the Department of Strateg Defense and Strategic Studies. The speakers are Mr. Jaydeva Radhade, President, Center for China Analysis and Strategy, Ambassador Gautam Bambavli. Former Indian Ambassador to China, Pakistan, and Bhutan, Professor Dr. Adilip Purana Mohite, former Dean and Professor and Head, Department of Political Science, MS University, Baroda, Gujarat, and the discussants are Lieutenant General A. L. Chavan and Professor Dr. Shikan Paranspe. I would request you all to come on the dais. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, second day of uh, strategic dialogue, we are going to start with the very important and pertinent issue on China's strategic agenda. Uh, in this session, we have very eminent experts on China who spend more than three decades of their lives on understanding the China and uh, we have eminent scholar as well as eminent uh, diplomat and uh, experts uh, who is going to deal with the China strategic agenda. Uh, first speaker would be uh, Jaydev Ranade, second would be uh, Ambassador Gautam Bambaoli. Uh, Professor Dilip Moiti is going to join in a few minutes. Uh, there will be two disc uh, discussion. Uh, Professor Srikant Paranjpe, who was the former head Department of Defense and Strategic Studies, and uh, General Chavan, uh, who is the emeritus professor in the department. I'm not taking too much time to introduce them. We all are uh, their contribution. We are, they all are in a, uh, our family, in a strategic community. So need, need, to, need not to be, have any uh, introduction. And without much taking time, uh, I will request to all experts to stick on the time. Uh, each one will uh, speak 15 minutes. Uh, I'll 
uh, use my bell uh, after completing a 15 minutes. For me, it is very difficult to give any order to this kind of senior person. But uh, uh, after 15 minutes, we can extend another two, three minutes. But by uh, each one, we'll have a around 20 minutes. So uh, there will be time for us to have a fair discussion. And uh, <coughs> all deliberation, uh, it is live cast. Uh, I would request to each one uh, switch off their mobiles. Uh, all my more than uh, two lakh students are watching these events online from their concerned colleges. So any moment in a hall, all are recorded. So kindly switch off the mobiles. Uh, don't uh, interact to each other and uh, uh, maintain the disciplines. So uh, again, once again, I welcome each one, uh, experts, panelists, uh, discussant, participant, uh, eminent audience from audience from the August House and uh, each one. So I would request uh, Jaidwajji uh, come forward. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Kare. <clears throat> uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to try and uh, give a different perspective. We all talk about China's rise. That's, in fact, the topic for today and its implications for the world. But while we say that, we also seem to assume that its rise is inexorable, that nothing can impede it, and it will dominate the world. I think from what I see that China is today in a state of at an inflection point. There are a lot of problems that it faces, which also need to be addressed. And the international environment is such that things are becoming unpredictable. Let me start by saying that we need to view China's rise in this context, in the context of the world being in flux, the world order being in a process of change at the moment. Existing major powers are looking for ways to retain their influence and continue to manage affairs in the future. The AUKUS is an example. Here we see the Anglo-Saxon triumvirate essentially looking to extend their influence and power into the future. They've cut out all non-Anglo-Saxon powers and they're looking to, in fact, continue to have an influence, a meaningful influence in the Asia Pacific in the future. That's rattled the Chinese, but it's uh, something that other countries here and other powers here also need to be thinking about. At the same time, what we are seeing are the new emerging powers also looking for a place at the global high table. Countries like Japan, India, Singapore, Vietnam, Australia, none of them are likely to willingly acquiesce to Chinese overlordship of this area. That's an obstacle that China has. It's an obstacle that it has to contend with, and it will come into the fore uh, in course of time. China itself, after four decades of uninterrupted growth, steady growth, has accumulated a lot of economic might. It's built up its military capabilities. And today they feel confident enough to push a diplomatic agenda to try and position themselves as a counterbalance to the United States. They're getting ready to either rival or surpass the United States. And Xi Jinping, the president of China, who just taken over as president for the third time, he appears to be a man in a hurry, if I may call it that. From the time he took over in 2012, he's been pushing a very aggressive and assertive agenda for China to move ahead. He's got this uh, feeling that he has to fulfill the dreams of his forebears. He has to make China a great nation again, and he's trying to carry a, a China along with it. But what happened was that while he unveiled the uh, plan for the rejuvenation of the great Chinese nation, as he called it, in 2012, when he took over uh, what he called the China dream, 
it was in 2017 at the 19th party congress that he really spelt out china's national agendas we can argue whether they are his agendas or china's but today they are china's agendas and there he said that by 2049 which is the 100th year of the founding of the people's republic of china he will make china into a major power with global pioneering influence it was clear that he had actually thrown the gauntlet and the united states recognized it as such because the only other country which has the capacity to influence or create international organizations is the united states and with this declaration china announced that it also would develop the same capacity uh, within two months of his throwing this challenge, uh, challenge by february the united states reacted and we saw that it picked out the most operational part of a nation's development which is technology and they went after china's technological capabilities one of china's ambitions also stated at that congress was that by 2035 it would be among the world's most advanced technology powers so the united states went after first their first technology champion which was the zte followed by huawei and have crippled both Huawei for a time sought to bluster, bluff and bluster its way by saying we'll manage it, we've built up alternate capacities, we've got a storage of uh, chips, etc. But soon they had to admit that they didn't have any of that and they stopped the manufacture of stuff. smartphones. Now they're having difficulty even with higher end chips. I think that their uh, technology capacity has been set back by a minimum of five to ten years, if not more. But interesting is what Chinese analysts said. They said Xi Jinping has committed a mistake. And this was within two months of his making this announcement when I met them. They said he's made a mistake. He's been premature. China does not have the power or wherewithal to really challenge the United States just yet. And uh, they were also uh, apprehensive. They said if the China United States does retaliate, then we will really be left friendless because we don't even have that kind of diplomatic influence. And their feeling was that they have two friends, North Korea and Pakistan. And they said, we don't want this to become a stark reality. It's something that I think bothers them even today. And another complication that came up or has come up since then is the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I'll come to that later. But that has sort of precipitated things which I think Xi Jinping uh, did not anticipate and certainly did not want. But in the midst of all this, while China's economic situation was undergoing stress and it was headed downwards, um, he made a bid for a third term, not only as General Secretary of the Chinese Communist Party, which is the most powerful post that he holds, but also for the honorific of being President of China. And the general secretaryship of the Chinese Communist Party, he got that at the 20th Party Congress, which was held last October. And last month, he became the president for the third time of China. But there are a couple of important things to note. It's not just the presidentship, but he also was able to bring in his loyalists, people who owed their lives to him into the key positions in the state council which is the chinese government or cabinet and into the party more importantly into the security apparatus which till now he did not have full control over he started in fact the purges and the cleansing of the security apparatus last year and he's now uh, trying to complete that xi jinping also tried to build his own capacity he realized that the Chinese Communist Party's legitimacy and ability to therefore rule the country or lead the country is getting dented. And he focused on a few issues here. One, that he was going to lift the people out of poverty and he claimed at this time when he took over as president in his first press interview that he has lifted the people out of poverty. The second statement he made was he's wiped out a century of humiliation for the Chinese people. We may agree, we may not agree, but these are the claims that he's made and which are being repeated by everyone else. 
he also has tried to boost China's image. And this is being done as much for the domestic audience as well as for the international audience. So what did we see? We see that uh, he sent his foreign minister or his top diplomat rather, no longer the foreign minister, with a 12 point plan for the peace between the Russia Ukraine war. It was a effort. It's not going to fly. It is tilted in favor of the uh, of Russia, but it was an effort to position China as a possible potential peacemaker and certainly a country that has the influence to try and present a peace plan. That's what he did. This was followed up by the success of the Saudi Iran Accords. Again, something where the United States could have interfered or could have intervened, but he stole the show. He went ahead and did it and tried to score uh, 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 an advantage. He followed that up with a visit to Putin, which everyone followed. A lot of international uh, experts, analysts have, I think, prematurely chosen to comment that China has taken the lead. China has shown how diplomatically powerful it is, and the US has therefore confirmed it to be in decline. To my view, that's a premature uh, assessment. Nothing has changed in China. People are now trying to say that by doing, undertaking these diplomatic moves, China is trying to show a peaceful face. On the ground, I don't see any of that happening, but I'll come to that in a bit. Along with this, there are a couple of things, I think, frailties that we need to look at. And as I mentioned, China's economic situation is causing the leadership a lot of worry. There is soaring unemployment, graduate unemployment, which is particularly important in a one child family country is at 35 percent. Thousands of businesses have shut down for various reasons. And in the midst of all this, Xi Jinping has cracked down on the technology and fintech sectors. They've also been compelled to shut down businesses. They've been compelled to lay off workers. Along with this, when the COVID hit China, it was a double whammy. With the economic crisis came the COVID. And there he opted for a zero COVID policy. Now, what zero COVID did was it impacted immediately the lives of the citizenry. Not only did he use COVID or the zero COVID policy to track citizens even more closely through their COVID apps, but he also uh, shut down cities the moment they, det they detected a few COVID cases. One out of 10 COVID cases, they shut the city down or they shut that area down. What happened? was that logistics got affected. Now, most of uh, China, or at least the cities in China, I'll just give you a scenario here. In zero COVID, they became dependent on two things. One, they were either picked up and put in uh, COVID uh, blocks, uh, regardless of what, ha what was happening in the family. So whether you're a child or a grown up or an elderly person, you were picked up and put into this quarantine and you were dependent on food supplies coming to your doorstep. Or if you stayed at your house, you uh, called your uh, local uh, uh, you know, supply person like we have Zomato, et cetera, they would come and deliver the food. But with zero COVID, with the lockdown taking place, the local delivery systems got impacted and people were not able to get their food. This caused a lot of resentment um, in addition to other things. Uh, but what he did was he appointed his loyalist Li Chang as the premier to try and uh, revive the economy. Now, a lot of people have pointed out that Li Chang has no uh, Li Chang has no experience of either being a vice premier or even a minister. But he's been party secretary of three wealthy provinces: Zhejiang, Changsu, and Shanghai. I think that qualifies him. But let's see. Time will tell. But anyway, he's got a loyalist there, a loyalist with this experience. And in his first press interview, he went out of his way to assure or reassure private entrepreneurs that they will be uh, looked after, policies will be tailored towards them. He also uh, referred to creating employment opportunities for 17 million graduates. So he made all the right noises in order to revive the economy. 
and a crucial point is that when he spoke about taiwan he uh, spoke about people to people contacts he spoke about business contacts what he did not speak about was reunification that's a strong message and it is one which as i said uh, international analysts used to also show that china has changed course it hasn't but anyway that's what he did he also spoke about restructuring of the government and there we come across the three to four main uh, priorities for this leadership for this government and for the next five years the first is economic development or what they call high quality development the second is security so that remains he has to keep his position intact the third is agriculture and these are the ones he's gone after and the fourth is science and technology the budgets of all these four sectors have increased the budget of national defense has increased none of the others have increased foreign policy has registered a, a small increase li chang has also announced and this reflects the poor state of the economy a 5% cut in central government employment he said of the current employees also 5% will be laid off uh, so this is the scenario in china today it's one where the situation is precarious the economic situation is precarious how far they can go one doesn't know and in the backdrop we have a deteriorating us china relationship one that is going to squeeze china even more already with covid what we notice is a surge in anti china sentiment around the world particularly in europe and the united states the result is very clear what europe and the us have done is they begun to close off their markets to china so chinese exports to europe and usa have dropped by 30% that's a lot for a country that is uh, export driven and they are looking for other markets that is why we find that in virtually every speech made by xi jinping he talks about safeguarding supply chains he talks about safeguarding their markets etc but i think personally that they're looking to um, uh, even a more difficult time in future i do not see the united states or europe uh, coming back to the old uh, uh, kind of arrangement or as open a market towards china as it used to be the other complication that has come in is the russia war russia's war with uh, ukraine now whether xi jinping was fully briefed on it or not one doesn't know but from the joint statement that they issued it is clear that xi jinping had more than an idea that putin is going to do something and he is going to require power for it because within a week of meeting him uh, putin withdrew russian forces that were deployed on the borders with china it's never been done before and he redeployed them against ukraine uh, the war has gone on it's gone on far longer than what the chinese thought chinese calculations have always been a short quick decisive war and here they find it's dragged on over a year now they're getting nervous they're getting nervous for two reasons one the war dragging on creates an uh, atmosphere of uncertainty about russia is putin going to survive or not is russia going to remain intact or not these are the two questions that xi jinping has in his mind and so does the rest of the chinese communist party if either goes it's a problem for them they do not want to be the only large communist power left standing for the west to turn its attention on xi jinping himself has invested a lot in putin and in russia and he does not want that investment to go waste so that's one factor the second is the growing apprehension among chinese communist party cadres that the united states is going to hit them with sanctions the united states if you have been following the news closely have already been saying that uh, they're not sure about how much support china is giving russia is it material support or not sometimes there are articles in new york times and washington post which by the way reflect the thinking of the administration in the us about some chinese companies being involved in extending material supplies to uh, russia the united states has also clamped down not only on 
companies that are supplying but also said that no US citizen or resident or green card holder can actually supply know-how and knowledge to Chinese companies or Russia. So this is the kind of climate that is coming in and the Chinese communists are afraid that the next step will be sanctions against China. I don't think personally that that's far-fetched, it can happen. But what bothers them is that 70% of the director level officers of the Chinese Communist Party across the country, their children are studying in either the United States, UK, Canada or Australia. And if the sanctions come into force, they'll be forced to pack their bags and come home within 24 hours. And all the money that these carders have stashed away outside and it's all illegal will be confiscated. It will directly impact 300 million Chinese. You can imagine the, I would say, tsunami that will happen. I think before that kicks in, there will be pressure on Xi Jinping to step down because he's already being accused by Chinese Communist Party carders in writing, in public, which is a very risky thing to do in China of having singularly mismanaged the Sino-US relationship. So that's the scenario that uh, we see uh, developing in front of us. But just a quick shot, as I said, into the future, uh, having done all this, having put his loyalists into position, let's try and peep a little bit into the future. What do we see? And I'm looking at it also from our point of view. We have 70,000 Chinese troops on our borders. We have, of course, an equal number of our own, but the situation is dense. Uh, our foreign minister called it fragile. Uh, it's tense. Anything can happen at any time. They tried to open up new fronts uh, in the east. More will happen. And I feel that we will see some more uh, situations arising, maybe conflagrations in, uh, uh, within a year uh, or, or over a year uh, in this time. The second is the situation that he is creating over Taiwan. There have been repeated statements by Xi Jinping that the reunification of China has to be completed in the what he calls the new era, which is his era. Now, you can only be sure of effecting something in your era if you are in charge. So that can be interpreted as he wants to complete the reunification when he is there, which is in this five year time. Let's see what happens. But what is happening is he has positioned his loyalists, as I said, everywhere. The Central Military Commission, which is the key body, out of seven members, five are people with experience of the Western Theatre Command, which is the live command in China, which is against us, or of the Eastern Theatre Command opposite Taiwan. Uh, they're all loyalists of his. Many of them are princelings. They're in charge. And at this National uh, People's Congress, he appointed a new Chief of Army Staff, a new uh, head of the Joint Staff Department, General Liu Chan Li, who is again um, a person with a lot of experience of uh, war. Now, so, so uh, he has got a battle-ready military commission uh, uh, organized and in place. And with American pressure on him growing, I think he feels that the window of opportunity for him is shrinking. And that is the danger point that I wanted to mention. It can provoke him into either taking some rash action quickly or precipitating uh, a situation that he wants to bring about, which could be reunification with Taiwan. I'll leave it at that. But all I'm trying to say is that things uh, for China are not all that clear cut. Its rise is not something which is to be taken for granted. Many things can happen to uh, stall that rise also. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Now I request uh, Honorable Ambassador Gautam Bambaliji to sit. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be with all of you. Um, Thank you, Department of Defense and Strategic Studies, Savitri Bhai Pule, Pune University. Thank you, Center for China Analysis and Strategy for inviting me. 
Dr. Khare has given me 15 minutes and when he was saying that it reminded me of when I was in service, a colleague of mine asked me, how the hell has the government of India posted you to both Pakistan and China? And my answer to my colleague was, because I speak very little, but I say a lot. So, so Dr. Kare, I, I'm going to speak very little. Hopefully I'll say a lot, but I'm going to finish well within the 15 minutes that you have allotted to me. So this session is on China's strategic agenda. And that leads us to ask ourselves, what is China's strategic agenda? I'll deal with it in one sentence, because that all, that's all it takes. China's strategic agenda, as we have heard repeatedly over the last day and a half, including by previous speakers, is to replace the United States as, as the number one power in the world, to move the world, to move international politics, to move geopolitics from a situation of Pax Americana to a situation of Pax Sinica. That's the single-minded, one-sentence agenda that China has in mind, that Xi Jinping has in mind. Now, what I'm going to do over the next few minutes is I'm going to share with all of you a hypothesis that I have developed. It's not been proved or disproved, so you can agree or disagree with my hypothesis, but I'll share this hypothesis with you and I hope some of the young students from the Department of Defense and Strategic Studies will actually take up the job of either proving or disproving that hypothesis. Now the hypothesis is, runs as follows, that the, the international politics or geopolitics today is characterized by one main trend. And that trend, of course, is competition between the two major powers, namely the United States on one hand and China on the other. The Russia-Ukraine crisis is actually a side, uh, you know, it's not the main movie, it's the trailer before the movie. The real uh, characteristic of international politics today and which is going to continue over the next 40, maybe even 50 years, is this competition which will get increasingly intense between the two major powers, the United States and China. Now, unfortunately, and this is what my hypothesis is, what China is trying to do in this competition is to replicate everything that the US has done and try to do it better. So China is unfortunately just following the lead that the United States has given since World War II and trying to do everything that the United States did, but do it better. I'll give you some examples. All of you or many of you have either traveled or seen photographs in the movies or otherwise of Manhattan in New York. It's a jungle of concrete, plate, glass and steel. Now, what has China done? It has built jungles of concrete, place, guard, uh, plate, glass and steel in its major cities, whether it's Beijing or Shanghai or many others across China. So it has tried to replicate exactly what the United States did, but tried to do it bigger and better. Second, in the 50s and 60s, uh, the United States built these huge expressways connecting the country north and to south, east to west. China has done exactly the same thing in the 1990s and in the early 2000s. It has built spanking new expressways better than in the United States, connecting the whole of China. Internationally too, China is doing exactly what the United States did over the past 70 years, only it is trying to do it better. And here, once again, let me give you many, many examples which exist. Because there are these multilateral development banks, the World Bank controlled by the United States. And now I believe there's a person of Indian origin who is going to be nominated. He has been nominated to be president. Mr. Banga is nominated to be president of the World Bank. There was the Asian Development Bank, which is run by Japan. So what did China do? It set up the AIIB, 
or the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, which is capitalized by the Chinese and run by the Chinese. Incidentally, India is also a big shareholder, the second most important shareholder in AIIB and the chief investment officer of AIIB so far since its inception has been an Indian national. Second example of how China is working within the system set up by the United States since the end of the, since the end of the World War, the Second World War. It has steadily worked to put Chinese nationals into important positions at UN bodies. So you have at least one, if not more, under secretary generals of the United Nations being of Chinese origin and Chinese nationality. You have a number of other bodies of the United Nations which are headed by Chinese uh, nationals. A third example, just like the US did earlier, China now in order to be able to project power is setting up bases across the world, not just in Djibouti, but also in the South China Sea. So just replicating the, the, what the Americans did over so many decades and not waiting to think whether this is the Chinese way of doing it or whether it is not. So what we find is that China has just been replicating what the US did, only trying to do it better. Now, my question and hypothesis to all of you is in its, it is so enraptured in this whole process of competing with the United States that is it being able to see that it is merely copying the United States where international politics is concerned. It is also China is steeped in this whole question of global power politics, of balance of power, and therefore, it wants to do exactly what the United States did 60, 70 years earlier, and maybe even up to recent times. So I believe, and I, this is my pro proposal and proposition to all of you, it's a hypothesis, so we need to prove it. But I believe that this is where China is, this, is, is showing its weakness. It is not coming up with new ideas of how to shape international politics. It's not coming up with new innovations of what kind of structures we can put in now that we're the second most powerful country in the world into geopolitics. Can some of these structures be different from what the United States did since 1945? It is completely oblivious to those kind of questions. And it is merely replicating everything that the United States did since 1945. So I believe that this is a weakness for China. I believe this could be the Achilles heel of China and which brings me, of course, to what we in India should be doing. So I believe that we in India, this is our time to hide our strength and bide our time. This is our time to focus domestically, internally in building up our economy. We grew by 8.7% in the previous year, I believe it's been now increased to 9.1%. We grew by 7% in the year which is ending on March 31st in a few days. We have to continue ensuring that India grows at 7 to 8% GDP growth per annum over the next 20, 25 years so that we not only build up our economic might, we not only improve the living standards of our people, but we also help in increasing and improving the quality of education in India, the quality of science research in India, the quality of technology innovation in India. All that will improve and increase as per capita incomes and the size of the GDP increases. So this is what we need to do. Internationally, geopolitically, what India needs to do is to find its own way. What my former boss, currently the External Affairs Minister of India, Dr. Jay Shankar, has written about, we have to find the India way in international politics and geopolitics. And you can see that we are beginning to do this. We are doing it in very, very important ways. The fact that Prime Minister Modi hosted so many leaders virtually from the global south 
the fact that we took the trouble to listen to what they have to say, what are their problems and what should be projected within the G20 as the voice of the global south is an important distinction and differentiation from the way the United States and now China, who is replicating the United States, behave. This is one important example. We need to find many such other examples and we need to have our foreign policy, our strategic choices, our uh, working in international politics and geopolitics infused by the sense of dharma which we all believe in and which is so ingrained in all of us and we have to also um, think of the principle of vasudeva kutumbakam which we mouth a lot but we are also now beginning to practice so that's my uh, suggestion about how india should go the india way and stay away from just replicating what the united states did as a great power and which china unfortunately is now just copying as a great power thank you very much for your attention dr khare i have stayed within my 15 minutes thank you sir thank you what you said is right is uh, very important for us to how to conceptualize within a time bound and time frame uh, Already I have uh, introduced Professor Dilip Mohiti, who is a uh, former Dean and uh, uh, former Head of uh, Department of Political Science, MS University, Baroda. Uh, sir, uh, without much taking time, uh, I hope that uh, we'll restrict the time, uh, 15 minutes plus 5 minutes, sorry. I tried to bribe you yesterday, <laughs> from I think, uh, for more time. Uh, 15 minutes is too small, smaller time for me because my presentation for which I worked for the last couple of weeks uh, would take, but I'll try my best to finish it in uh, 15 to 20 minutes or maybe some grace period will be given to me by gracious chairman. Anyway, uh, Professor Kare, Dr. Radhade, Ambassador Gautam Bombwale, Lieutenant General Chavan, and my dear friend and colleague Srikant Paranjape, ladies and gentlemen. Actually, when I was given this topic about few weeks, two or three weeks back, I was wondering how to handle it. My department, which was one of the most pioneer departments in the country, especially in the field of international relations and political theory, we always tried to interpret the international currents and events through the lens of theory. We kept a close watch on the development of certain theories which emerged soon after the Cold War. I won't go into the pre-Cold War or a uh, or uh, immediately after the, I, I would ha rather handle it immediately after the Cold War. The reason being that the lots of work has been done on Cold War and therefore I will concentrate myself on the post-Cold War period. I will quickly mention that so far as the end of Cold War was concerned, Fukuyama, Francis Fukuyama, came out with a very nice and controversial book, End of History, whereby he claimed that the, the victory of democracy over uh, communist ideology. That's one thing, I won't go into the details. The second uh, book which came out was by Paul Kennedy, Rise and Fall of Empires. Now this particular, you know, concept for the first few years, the USA had not taken place, but then some of the practitioners of foreign policy realized that if this particular this state theory of rise and fall, since most of the empires have fallen in the past, and this may apply to the United States. And then soon after that, after a few years, people started talking about a decline of United States power over the other, over the globe, I would say. Now, this particular 
you know, phenomena was again uh, added by Joseph Nye, the clash of civilization. Now, from all this uh, theoretical framework, India has also developed strategic ch challenges, which I will try to deal to the best of my knowledge in about 15 to 20 minutes time. Now, so far as decline of America is concerned, again, there were two different schools of thought. Number one, Paul Kennedy, you know, was followed by a certain practitioners and they said that the United States would also fall and therefore we must take the necessary steps to see that the US power remains at the apex of the triangular uh, world order. That was what the imagine was, imagination was. The United States wanted to remain at the apex of the triangle. At the second level, it wanted certain you know, countries like China, Russia, India, Japan, South Africa, etc., etc. And then at the third level, the countries which did not have either or uh, were known for military or uh, financial power. Now, this was the actually world order that was envisaged. But then in those days, when this, this particular idea was floated, China and India opted for multipolar world order. <coughs> now, this particular multipolar or, or world order would emerge from the new world, the, the new world order, which was actually envisaged by so many countries. But then on the other side, the United States, which wanted to remain at the apex of the triangle, the global order, started working in direction of preparing a kind of a new containment policy of China, because China was also, number of books have come out, so far as the China's rise is concerned. Peaceful rise, they said, but then we must remember that the Chinese strategy always says that there can be only one tiger on the mountain. What it interprets is that there can be one and not United States, but probably we would replace United States as a superpower. That is one thing. Second thing, the Chinese, though it, they said that it is a peaceful rise, they started working quietly because their stratagem says that do everything in a dark so that your opponent does not come to know about it. Now, that's a very good lesson for not only China, but we can also imbibe it. What we are doing, we should not, we should not, uh, you know, make a broadcast of the things that we have got this many tanks uh, deployed at this place and this many, you know, troops are deployed, this many aircrafts are deployed, nothing. You work in such a way that create a kind of a deterrence so far as China is concerned. Now, my, you know, other details, I would not go into the details, but uh, I would like to state that the war will not take place in the near future. Why I say? Because China is on the way to become a superpower. It has not become a superpower. It's not been designated as a superpower. And whatever that China has achieved, it will be destroyed if there is a war between USA and China, or even for that matter, India can also cause a very serious damage to Chinese interest in Pakistan, particularly CPEC. So China would like to preserve its economic wing, which is which they are trying to spread in West Asia. They, are, they have already spread their wings in uh, Africa, then in Asia. They followed a policy of first eliminating India as an obstructionist power and then established their complete hold over the entire Asia. But then there are a couple of, you know, uh, restraints that the China faces and these restraints or a containment is being imposed by, uh, by the United States by offering certain, you know, new alignments like you may call it AUKUS or you may call it uh, quadrilateral, you know, uh, treaties between Japan, India, United States, and maybe one or two other uh, Philippines or other countries. Uh, I may have made a mistake here, four powers, but India is definitely there. Now, doing, taking this particular thing into account, 
as we used to talk about encirclement of India by China. And then, you know, the arguments were made by experts in one of the seminars that Sri Lanka, they have an influence. Pakistan is almost gone with the Chinese. And uh, so far as Bhutan is concerned, it is actually playing certain role. Nepal is also a fluid situation, whether it will go towards India or towards China or would remain neutral. Still, we are not in a position to, uh, you know, uh, uh, any uh, uh, predict about it. Of course, the practitioners of diplomacy may know more about it. But so far as I'm concerned, a theoretician and looking at the China-India development from a distance uh, is not in a position to tell you with a specific, you know, point that th this particular development will take place. Moving further, so far as, you know, the rhetoric is concerned, China has started propagating that the American power is declining and there was talk within America, in Europe, and elsewhere also. Zakaria has written a beautiful article. It's not that the, the, uh, the, the American power has declined, but other powers have come up, so the distance between America and uh, the other powers has reduced. It has not declined. So far as soft power is concerned, I think America has a tremendous advantage over China. Joseph Nye has said that the soft power of America plays a very important role in the in the global politics. Hard power, of course, you know, the Americans have, you know, now there are several, you know, factors, you know, one can attribute to the American behavior. Whether it is good or bad, war in Iraq was good or bad, war in uh, uh, encouraging Iraq to, uh, or a, a, a war in Iraq, sorry, Kuwait war, was proper or improper, Inter intervention in Afghanistan was good or bad, and then, you know, it said that uh, uh, it involved itself into certain, you know, conflicts with no return so far as the United States is concerned. It spent billions of dollars, billions of dollars, and it actually caused the decline of uh, American dollar to, uh, to an extent. On the other side, the Chinese were avoiding any military engagement. They had hardly any war per se after, I mean, like you, you may call it a 1962, a small war between India and Pakistan, uh, sorry, India and China. But here, when I talk about, you know, India and Pakistan or India and China, the nexus between Pakistan and China, I go back to 1971 when Kissinger said that don't ask us for any help if the Chinese intervene in the war, 1971 Bangladesh war. Another thing, another important thing was that the Pakistan-China nexus was interpreted by a strategic thinker, a very fine scholar, Raju G.C. Thomas. He said that India should be prepared. He said this thing towards the middle of uh, 80s and uh, 90s, early 90s. He said that we should, India should be prepared for one and a half war. One full war with China and half a war with Pakistan or one full war with Pakistan and half a war with uh, uh, China. Now, I altered this particular theory and has come to the conclusion that today India must be prepared for two wars. Now, practically speaking, we do not have that capability of facing two wars. And therefore, India has started, I would say, uh, hedging or bandwagoning foreign policy. Now, this is not a very pleasant word to speak, but it's a fact. Now, that has put India's foreign policy under tremendous strain. It's like a rope walking, whether we are this side or that side. Another thing that has happened is that the Indian silence on Ukraine war, whether it has helped us or it is not going to help us because you know either we are with the Russians by saying that we have remained quiet in the UN or the Americans are unhappy about it or we can say that 
covertly we are supporting the American side. Now, let me tell you, so far as bandwagoning is concerned or, uh, you know, looking for some sort of a help from the Americans, the general behavior of the Americans is that they never fight or intervene. John Gaddis has clearly stated that the superpowers or the great powers do not interfere in the third world conflict, third party conflict, I would say. Now, looking to this particular, you know, point, if there is a war between India and China, hypothetically speaking, the US would like to support India, not directly, but indirectly, like what they have done in Ukraine. Fine. But then that actually help was also sought in 1962 by Nehru. Prior to, you know, uh, 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 Tibetan uh, uh, crisis, Nehru knew that the Chinese power is tremendous. He consulted uh, chief of the army staff, uh, General Karyapa, and said that, can we take on China? And Karyapa said, no, it's a practical advice. Why it was a practical advice? Because almost more than two thirds of the Indian army was busy in Kashmir. The rest of the one fourth army was attired after the Second World War. The officers had, uh, you know, like the senior most officer was at the most, you know, brigadier or uh, major general. The rest of the officers were not having any war experience. Anyway, so, but then Nehru wanted to create a deterrence. He went to United States asking for supersonic aircrafts. And that is one reason, again, that we could not use our air force because those aircrafts were not capable of flying for a longer time, more than 40 minutes or 45 minutes, and they were not capable of fighting in the mountainous region. Anyway, so deterrence was created. So I come back to the present situation where we are diplomatically forced to create a kind of a deterrence in the form of joining the Western Bloc, but at the same time, our dependency on Soviet Union makes us uh, kind of a, a, you know, soft towards even the uh, Russians. Now, if you look to the entire scenario, which I mean, I have not been able to put everything together, but then looking to the entire scenario, yesterday I was talking, uh, we were discussing very brief discussion with Professor Chari, and he said that economic interest competition or that there are two issues, economic cooperation, economic competition. I slightly modify this that when there is an economic competition, it may also lead to war. Like what happened in the 19th century, the, the contest between the European powers. Now, Thomas Friedman has said, wherever there is an economic interest involved, people would refrain from war. That's one thing. And the Chinese would not initiate a war. They might, you know, uh, uh, express their, uh, you know, anger. They may use rhetoric over Taiwan. But so many years have passed, but they have not taken any concrete step. They have only used rhetoric, threats that we will not tolerate, all those things. The Americans have also retaliated by saying, that the China must know the cost of time, you know, uh, uh, conflict on Taiwan. So each one is trying to make each other realize the cost of war, and it is going to be unbearable. <coughs> it is going to be unbearable for the United States as well as for the Chinese, and therefore I feel that there are certain constraints on China. It will be. Uh, contain or it will be refrain from taking any major actions either against India or against. And then when it comes to Pakistan, our dispute with Pakistan and I put Pakistan, China has made it very clear to Pakistan that we will not help you if you initiate a war on India. Very clearly they have stated, a Chinese foreign minister. Uh, <coughs> thank you. Then, you know, if India attacks you, then we will interfere because Chinese economic and a very important interest lies in Pakistan and that is 
There are several other interests, of course, but the most important is CPEC. China is dependent on oil from the Gulf region. And today they have to pass through certain, you know, sea lanes, which are narrow, uh, Strait of Malacca, that can be choked by India, that can be choked by United States, and they, their oil supply can be cut off. So as an alternative arrangement, Chinese have put a kind of a project by which the oil from the Gulf area will straightway come to Gwadar airport and the CPEC, that is the road which is being built, the, the communication line, will reach China without endangering their tankers carrying ship. So if you take all these perspectives, then I would say that there is no possibility of war, but there will be a rhetoric of war. Again, I would like to subscribe to the view by Strait, S-T-R-A-I-T, a very good uh, scholar on the conflict uh, uh, and the war studies. He says that we should now go for MAS, mutually agreed survival. And from that perspective, I feel that both Pakistan, Pakistan is also in a bad shape to initiate any conflict. But I would strongly say to the defense experts and the, and the strategists, the diplomats, that we should not be complacent. No complacency. We have to assume that the war is going to take place tomorrow and we have to be prepared for it. We have to create a deterrence. In fact, you'll be surprised I've got certain documents which proves that Nehru was also interested in creating a deterrent in the form of nuclear bomb. There were several meetings between him and Baba and he was insisting that you should make it as fast as possible because he knew that militarily they cannot take on China. And therefore, I would conclude, I mean, there are a number of things I can go on for one hour. A professor should not be given 20 minutes, but knowing his habit and uh, culture, he can speak for one hour or two hours continuously. But I have to cut short my uh, presentation by saying that this particular topic is extremely delicate, but we have to delicate uh, and we have to deal with this delicacy with a lot of thinking and there should be a coordination between the academics, the diplomats, the army, uh, the defense uh, forces and maybe the social because we, uh, last point I will say with your permission chairman sir, just la one minute, that India is fragile. Socially, social structure of India is fragmented. And if you read the history of the Second World War, then you'll realize that the underground gave hell to the German army. Now, we may not have that kind of a situation, but I fear that that situation can be created very easily by the fragmentation of this country. And therefore, we have to integrate this country on the basis of either secularism or liberty, equality and fraternity to all the citizens. And therefore, I would like to say that India's social structure, because social society is the first base, second base is the state, man, family, society, and the state. The state will be strong only if our society is strong. And today, our social structure is fragmented, and that is one of the biggest, you know, weakness that probably could be exploited. Just about a few days back in Kerala, there was a there was a demonstration by the leftist forces. About uh, uh, ten or ten kilometers long, people marched. It was so long, and they went and protested somewhere. Now these are again very bad signs. The the point I am making is that the world is divided into haves and haves not. I have read a couple of books like Empire, beautiful theoretical book. Then another book is uh, by Rutkoff, The Rulers. The rule, the globe is ruled by just five or six thousand people, the elites. And rest of the masses are deprived masses. And that's not a good sign for the global security. And ultimately, India is a part of the globe that would affect India also.
Thank you very much, sir, for your generous uh, consideration of giving a little extra time for me, and thank you for your patient hearing. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Once the teachers start the lectures, uh, hardly you know stop you know before sixty minutes. But uh, sir has rightly you know conceptualized within a time, not that much time. We have chosen two discussants. Uh, one is General Chavan and Professor Shrikant Paranjpe. Uh, first, I request General Chavan will make it uh, just initiate the discuss to the ideas. Then from here. Then, uh, Professor Shrikant Paranjpe, then we'll have a question and answer. Thank you. Uh, morning, sir. Morning, Mr. Ranade. And morning, Mr. Bambawale. What a great pleasure. Good morning, sir. Uh, there are many familiar uh, faces in the audience, and I saw one face of my boss walking in very slowly. And morning, sir. Jan Samanwar happened to be my boss in MO Directorate. And he joined to listen to me. So uh, I'll start off with a little coverage on the two papers which were presented earlier, the thoughts given by uh, Sri Ranade, and then cover the thoughts given by uh, Ambassador Bambawale. And thereafter, I'll give you a little perspective of my own. That's how I'll sum it up. Uh, when you look at the thoughts of uh, Ambassador uh, Sri Ranade, they focused around the internal problems which China is facing and plus how they are planning to overcome which is creating serious amount of internal friction. And of course, the, he's given a very good perspective of how the Russia-Ukraine war is impacting this particular relationship between them and how it is going to play out in this game, which is mentioned on the board at the back. So he's given a lovely perspective of that. And uh, then we had Ambassador Bambawale who gave out his hypothesis. Hypothesis generally coming to the conclusion that we should hide, bide and build. And when we do hide, bide and build, uh, like the Chinese did uh, during the times of Deng, then probably we should also look at our own national sovereignty and what is in our interest keeping the overall uh, ambit of Vasudev Kutumbakam in all this. So when we look at uh, Vasudev Kutumbakam, I hope we are on the same grid as far as the overall strategic direction of India is concerned. We are looking at one planet and we are looking at one people, one earth, one people and we are looking at the welfare of everyone. That's what uh, our Prime Minister, Honorable Prime Minister says, and that's what Vasudev Kutumbakam is all about. Now let me get back to the big question which is there on the board. Five minutes for that. Mythologically, you know, the Chinese say that uh, one of the earliest emperors, ancient times, he sent out few Chinese because he wanted a potion for rejuvenation because Chinese keep talking about this rejuvenation. So he sent out few Chinese to go and look for this potion for rejuvenation, men and women. These men and women got lost and they did not come back and he never got the potion for rejuvenation. The Chinese myth also says that these men and women are the ones who founded Japan. So that's a very, very interesting myth. Second, you know, we must look at where these two positions are coming from, the Chinese position and the American position. American, when I say, I say the Western position and the Chinese position where it is coming from. So when the Chinese look at how they have evolved to the present status of challenging the West, as the West says they are going to do, it comes from being the middle kingdom for close to 2000 plus years and being an economy which gave 40% of the GDP to the world and out of that only 2% was foreign trade. So that is for figures for you. And they are coming from that kind of a position 
which had great sense of internal satisfaction in being a nation in themselves until the west went and invaded and spoiled the entire equation and uh, you know how it went the chinese suffered as per them and as per the known facts a century of deep humiliation and that deep humiliation after having built the trenches from which the western pass fought the germans and what is the promise which the americans had made to the chinese that will give you the port of qingdao with the jab with the germans have got once we've defeated the germans and they never gave it back so when mao wrote his book he said that among the hangmen in the west the americans are the worst so that is where the chinese are coming from a very rich history a kingdom which was for 2000 years the middle kingdom self sufficient and they have their own way of doing things they have evolved during the struggle for the when the chinese communist party was coming to power and the they had to fight the nationalists you are aware of it this struggle was played by the russians and the americans between them and it was the russians who eventually supported the chinese to come on top come out on top so this is where the chinese are coming from so the deep set hatred and distrust for america flows from there yes, from yes, the americans being the worst hangmen among the west the american position comes from an international order which they have created this international order helps americans and their western allies only it is primarily meant for that so you see there is a clash of two strategies which is taking place it is the clash of a strategy which the chinese are putting up and it's a clash of strategies with the western world is putting up western world wants to continue this particular international order with the chinese want to change and that sorry, is where generous up sorry i'm just saying. okay so i will leave it at that what i'm saying is for india is this the best strategy that we follow the white people the anglo saxons or is there an alternate strategy can we look at the chinese seriously a little more will it help thank you thank you mr uh, gant professor thank you sir dignities on the dais ladies and gentlemen let me flag four or five specific issues which have been raised and leave it at that one the first issue that i would flag is the whole question about rules based world order um the post second world war order which is essentially a rules based world order based on political security aspects of united nations economic aspects of perhaps the bretton wood conference the challenge to this at one level had come from the non aligned group limited but it had come from the non aligned group today if china is seeking to challenge this world order something which ambassador bambwali was talking about challenging this world order and create an alternative world view what kind of an alternative world view are we talking about see at one level if india is trying to talk of the southern perspectives china during the times of mao zedong or chao enlai was talking of a particular world view which had some relevance today it has to come out with some alternative world view which would be really acceptable as an alternative to the rules based world order what new world order or what new rules based order it is going to talk about second in the context of ukraine both the early speakers mentioned ukraine china is perhaps watching very closely the limitations of american commitment in ukraine commitment both in terms of how much how much to extend material support but more than that limitations coming from the american mindset starting from vietnam going over to korea going over to issues like iraq or afghanistan 
would they be able to or would they want to commit again to any such kind of global commitments outside of the region that calculation for china would determine how it would strategize so far as taiwan is concerned south china sea is concerned in fact this is something which also the australians and japanese are looking at which is why more interest in quad which is why more interest in india for that for, for that matter third issue that i would like to flag flag is a diplomatic offensive at one level the diplomatic offensive comes at a, at a global level in form of peace proposals for ukraine or peace proposals in the middle east that is at the global level at the regional level the offensive is from the bri both road and belt and road initiatives whatever its success or failures and how it would go forward whether the economic dimension political dimension or what whatever fourth issue that i would like to flag is the domestic problems again this has been raised earlier and i am specifically talking about this exports declining something which was said by the first speaker marketing markets getting closed down or fear of sanctions almost a kind of a return to the trump era maybe in terms of trump policy the other aspect of domestic issues would perhaps be tibet chinese policies about tibet policies about uyghur uyghur which has been talked about earlier and now not so much fifth and the last point that i would make is regarding india there has been a shift in indian perspectives about use of force in the 1950s 60s the policy nehruian framework if you want to use that had been force has a utility but why shout it out to quote nehru why talk of it all the time um, quotes from tibor mende subsequently use of force yes but with a kind of an apologetic frame of reference today use of force there's a public posture there's a public posture force to be used if necessary appropriate force to be used if necessary it and that has been shown in the context of pakistan and china that is a shift which has taken place these are the five issues that i would flag based on the on the presentations made earlier and i would stop at that thank you thank you sir thank you first uh, give a round of applause to all three eminent experts and to discussion Uh, we have uh, 15 minutes with us uh, because uh, we have to be restrict the time. Uh, then we'll break for tea, and then 11:15 we are going to start online session. So all experts are waiting. So three questions we will have it. Uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor Ranit Sir, first you have it. Uh, like. Thank you. Uh, I just have a very brief question, but before that, I really want to compliment and really excellent, excellent panel. I know the time is limited, but uh, thank you all for a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Specific question to uh, Jaydev Ranade. You mentioned that uh, Xi Jinping, and you focus a lot of your uh, comments on this one personality. So it looks as if your thesis is that the one personality is going to have an overpowering or disproportionate influence on Chinese strategy. My question to you is that you said that Mr. Xi Jinping is is going to act or is keen to act on reunification. Now Taiwan has 23 million people, right, and uh, 1.3 billion. What is the feedback, or what is the sense among the Taiwanese people about reunification? So, thank you. I did. Uh, uh, I didn't want to focus entirely, but I did uh, certainly sketch out in some detail Xi Jinping. I think he is uh, maybe the main driver today in China's policies. Uh, he has certainly been the most assertive and aggressive uh, in pushing China's policies, including reunification. Coming to your uh, question about what the Taiwanese feel, as it happens, I was in Taiwan very recently, and there are uh, three points that uh, come to my mind when we discuss this question. The first is the Taiwanese people themselves; they seem to be divided on what is really happening. They don't want to become another Ukraine. That seems to have become a fairly uh, prominent uh, issue in the course among themselves. The second is that while 
there are uh, there is a slight dip in the number of Taiwanese who today refer to themselves as Taiwanese instead of Chinese and earlier it was you know more Chinese than Taiwanese uh, people uh, say that that dip doesn't really matter it's barely half a percent but the third point is that uh, I think the Chinese are following a two-pronged policy and I did make a reference to the new premier Li Chiang's uh, omission of the phrase reunification with Taiwan. I think what we are seeing, or what at least I'm seeing, with Ma Ying Chao's visit, the former president's visit to uh, China, uh, with Tsai Ing-wen's visit to the United States, is that the Chinese are going to redouble their efforts at united front activities inside Taiwan. The attempt will be to try and weaken Taiwan from within, or weaken Taiwan's resolve to stand up to China from within. I think that is the Chinese effort, but uh, they're also preparing to change the environment which they are. Uh, there have been repeated um, military exercises, air and uh, sea exercises around Taiwan, which have, I think, begun to strain the Taiwanese resources. So they are following a two-track policy. I don't think Ta uh, Xi Jinping has given it up, but let me throw one uh, thought to you that it doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to go for Taiwan itself. He might go for one of the outlying islands and then claim to his people that he has begun the process of reunification. For him, that will be victory enough. Thank you. Thank you. From last side, students, right? Yes. Give it come. To whom you want to question, ask the question? So it's a general question. General Kush, okay, yeah. welcome. We use the per capita income, this keyword, as well as economical development for this global world. What do you think uh, with uh, rise of China, this keyword, when we think about the fall of China, how this impact the global orders? Uh, internal issues are going on and uh, at, at present in Indian market itself, we are completely dependent on the China's market. Without that, even uh, when we compare with the electronic market, electrical engineering as well as the renewable energy, renewable energy sources we are depend as well as the global world is depend on the china and when we talk about the fall of china how it's going to impact overall system thank you maybe the next uh, conference can be on the fall of china and its implications but uh, just, I mean, in a more lighthearted way, let me say half the world will be happy, the other half will be wondering how to tackle it. I don't think we need to be worried personally as India on uh, China's decline, because it will not fall as such, it will decline, its power will decline. For us, it will be a good thing. Anyone from this side? Uh... No? Great. My work, uh, half work has been done now. Thank you very much. For, uh, I'm really happy that uh, within a stipulated time, all eminent experts, they finish their presentation. Uh, uh, on behalf of the Department of Defense and Strategic Studies, on behalf of the Center of China Studies and Analysis, uh, I express my deep gratitude to each one for patiently listening. Uh, before making final announcement, uh, I would request uh, Jaydev Ranariji to felicitate uh, all eminent experts. First, Professor Dilip Mohithi. <laughs> Sir. Ambassador Bombawali, sir. Sir, This is. General Chauhan, sir.
एंड प्रोफेसर श्रीकांत परांश पे Thank you, sir. Uh, we will have a tea break. Uh, sharp 11:15. We are going to start second uh, second session on crisis in South China uh, Sea and uh, Taiwan, and all experts are going to join on online. So my request would be uh, be in time in a hall. Uh, we will start sharp 11:15. We'll have a break for a cup of tea. This backside. Thank you. Thank you very much.
जिम विल्सन हेलो Hello, Hello, your Jim. attention, please. Hi. Those who have had their tea, I would request you all to come in the hall and be seated because we'll start exactly at eleven fifteen. Uh, Mr. Jill, uh, Jim Wilson, uh, we've admitted you. Can you hear me, please? Yes, indeed. Can you hear me? Uh, am I very clear? Yes. Yeah. No problems. Okay. Yeah. Thank you and welcome. Uh, uh, we'll start in five minutes' time. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Excellent. Air Marshal Bhushan Gokhale, me? sir. Yes. How are you? Yeah. Yeah. Can you see me? Uh, am see I audible? You yeah. You are audible, and can you see me? Yes, sir. Yeah. Good. Thank you, sir. We'll start in All five right. minutes. Sure. And Doctor Do Than Hai. Yeah. Now we are waiting for him to join us. Okay. Yeah. So in five minutes time, as I said, we'll start the session. Thank you. So Jim, how's Kuala Lumpur? Oh, it's excellent. You are in KL, aren't you? Once again, I request all of you all to be seated for the second session, and uh, we have some of them online. We have the chairperson, Air Marshal Bhushan Gokhale, online. Uh, we have speakers, Dr. Do Thai Hai, online. Mr. Jim Wilson, online. May I request uh, Professor Roger Liu and the discussants, Air Marshal S. S. Soman. And Arvind Kumar to take their seats on the dais. Okay. Mrs. Bharti, the dais is not visible. Mrs. Bharti, can you hear me? I can hear you, sir. Uh, to answer your question a moment ago, kale is great. It's great food, great weather, very nice people. You know all the all the things that you uh, you hope for in a place to live. Nice, nice to hear that. I'm in South Africa. Oh, are you? Okay, we're in South Africa. <laughs> this meeting is being recorded. Uh, Mrs. Bharti, the stage is not the is not visible. Where Marshal Soman and Dr. Harbin Kumar are sitting. Uh, so they are making the stage arrangement, and we'll start. Okay, so you tell me when to start. Yeah.
May I start? Uh, so we are waiting for uh, Dr. Dothan Hai to come online. He's just joining us. So we'll have to wait for a minute, please. Sure. Uh, okay. Uh, Bhushan, sir, in the meanwhile, you could start with your remarks. One minute. Huh? Uh, Bhushan, sir, uh, yeah. meanwhile, you can make it uh, introductory remarks and uh, introduce the guest. Uh, by the okay. time he will come. Huh? Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, good morning to all of you and a good afternoon, Jim, from Southeast Asia. Oh, we have now. Uh, Very good morning. Dr. Thanhai from Delhi the Deputy Chief of Mission of Vietnam in Delhi. And of course, uh, uh, the third uh, speaker, that is Jaroja, uh, who is in Flame University in Pune, Dr. Arvind Kumar and M. Marshall Soman, who are discharged. Dr. Arvind Kumar is a senior professor at JNU. And uh, we have M. Marshall Soman, who holds the first chair of uh, Marshall of the Air, that is uh, Arjun Singh, a uh, fighter pilot, and he has served in the Western Air Command, which looks after part of Pakistan as well as China. And uh, Jim Wilson, who's an expert on China, is uh, joining us from Kuala Lumpur. So good afternoon to you. It's, it's indeed a privilege. And thank you very much, Dr. Kare and Dr. Mr. Ranade for having this second strategic dialogue in Pune. I'm speaking to you from South Africa. And uh, it's indeed really nice that at the moment, FX, that is, uh, you know, there's an exercise between India and the African nations is going on in Pune. And yesterday we had a wonderful talk by the army chief at the inaugural. Talking about my panelists, they're experts. We have uh, Dr. Do Thanh Hai from Vietnam, who's written a book also on Indo-Pacific. Uh, he is an uh, expert on all these affairs, which we will talk about today in the Indo-Pacific. There is Jim Wilson, also a China expert. He is in the U.S. Embassy in Kuala Lumpur. He is a John Hopkins University you know, expert. And of course, he has served in Washington also on the China desk. And Roger Chi Feng is from Taiwan at the moment in the Flame University. Uh, earlier, he was in OP Jindal and he's had an illustrious career as a science expert. So with this, let me just start by mentioning to you that uh, there's going to be a slight change after me. Dr. Du Thang Hai is going to speak. And since he has to leave at 12 o'clock, once he finishes, we will take a few questions and answers for him in particular before he leaves. And thereafter, we'll continue with the rest of the panelists. As regards the important topic that we're going to discuss, they're both linked, Indo-Pacific and Taiwan. Regardless of the nine dash line, the Chinese have continued to build artificial islands. And although they lost the case against Philippines in the tribunal at Hague in 2016, disregarding all that, they continue to carry on with their explorations and making these islands military bases and it, everybody in Southeast Asia is worried because there is a tremendous amount of, you know, uh, uh, Spratly Island and around the sea, there are lots of interests that every nation has in Southeast Asia. But the Chinese have today a great heft. You know, I was speaking to Mr. 
Ambassador Anil Wadhava, some time back when I had met him in Thailand. Ambassador Wadhava is at the moment in Vivekanand in Delhi. And I remember he mentioning that US seems to be vacating Southeast Asia. There is a vacuum. And I mentioned this when I went for RAND dialogue is subsequently. And surprisingly, you find that there is no doubt that today Southeast Asian countries, though they keep on talking about uh, China as one of the important you know, players, nobody takes a very firm stand against China. Actually, as a matter of fact, even Vietnam, which is the only country to have you know, kind of stood against China in 1978, today there are signs that they are trying to rebalance their relations with China. And then one of our foreign secretaries and later uh, NSA, he mentioned that similar thing is happening in the Middle East. And the U.S. is seems to be moving away from Middle East, especially after the shale oil was found. And that's true. And that is where the Chinese are made inroads. And today, their kind of diplomacy, the arc rivalry between uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran, they have shaken hands. And now Saudi Arabia is also looking at establishing embassy in Syria, earlier not heard of. And so there is a Chinese uh, diplomatic uh, kind of uh, offensive going on. I know Jaydev Ranade mentioned that there are a lot of inflection points. The Chinese are not doing very well, maybe domestically, but as regards outside, there is a lot of footprint. Even in South Africa, where I speak from, South Africa, as you know, is the uh, major country of G20 from this particular continent. And uh, they have relations with Taiwan and biggest liaison office of Taiwan is in South Africa. However, the Chinese are big way here, just about five kilometers from where I stay in my son's house at the moment, there is a Chinese mall. And almost every place that I see there are China products. South Africa is indebted to China by 4% of the GDP. So similar things are happening all over Africa. I think that's another neglected area where now maybe Russians of course are moving in and US and Europe are still busy trying to get in. Chinese have made sure that dollar is getting sort of uh, on the second place by doing direct trade in yuan. So there are issues which are where Chinese are trying to counter and come to kind of a player as a second player or first player in, in the world and by their 2049 date line. Apart from the what is going on in sea, the salt water, for the Southeast Asia, there is also the sweet water. All the rivers are going into Southeast Asia, including in Vietnam, you have Mekong River, which is one of the biggest rivers giving sweet water. And of course, all the, uh, including where Jim is, the Malaysia, the Thailand, and Iravadi in uh, Myanmar. So, you know, in all places, there is sweet water and the salt water kind of a, you know, heft that the Chinese are showing. We in India are worried about the, what they're going to do on the dams and the rivers flowing from Tibet into Brahmaputra. So the, the one has to sort of take into account this uh, dragon in all our calculations. So I do find that, uh, you know, in this particular dialogue today, we will be having uh, a wonderful discussion and question answers. Uh, by the way, while we talk, China becomes the biggest trading partner across the world. Regardless of COVID and the supply chain problems, US exports ma imports maximum from China. India, second trading partner. Vietnam, first trading partner. Entire Southeast Asia, first trading partner. And likewise, you find that they have a tremendous amount of trade imbalance, but then there are domestic problems, which of course were referred to by Dr. Jayadev Ranade and others earlier. There is one issue which happened yesterday. Honduras was the 14th country to have had diplomatic relations with Taiwan and they broke relations with Taiwan yesterday. And yesterday, as Ranade mentioned, we had the president, past president of Taiwan visiting Shanghai. First time after Kuomintang was formed. So that is after 49, a first visit and that goes to show the kind of influence operations that uh, China is launching. As you know, Xi Jinping mentioned that he wants to have academic and uh, you know social 
uh, contacts with Taiwan. And I think this is one of the ways that he's going to do it because the ex-president is going to be talking to students. And uh, as mentioned by in the question answers where uh, Dr. Ajit Ranade asked about whether the Taiwanese people want a war. And I think uh, there is a, certainly an issue of large, looming large as to if Taiwan is going to become another Ukraine. So are Americans ready to put the boots on the ground? Are the Americans going to give only weapons? Americans are going to wet their feet in the southeast, uh, in the you know the sea. All these questions need to be asked, answered, and maybe you know we can come to some sort of a logic conclusion in this session. With this, I hand over to Dr. Dothan Hai for his uh, comments. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, excuse me, sir. Just a small little announcement before we begin with the. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay, we continue with Dr. Deotanai. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Yes. So thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And Marshall, uh, if I pronounced your name correctly. And uh, actually, it's a very privilege for me to become a, a, a panelist in this discussion. And I think that is a very important topic. For that, I would like to thank you, well, the Center for China Analysis and Studies, a Department for Defense and Strategic Studies, uh, SPPU, and especially Mr. J. Andarve Ranadade and uh, Ramata for inviting me to speak on this. And I'm uh, currently working associated with Embassy of Vietnam, India, but I would like to today to speak on my own as a scholar and a researcher, what I have been uh, for a couple of decades follow what happened in the South China Sea. And it's also that the focus of my presentation. Before going on, on into detail, could I know how much, uh, how much time that I have been given to speak on this? 12 to 15 minutes, sir. 15 minutes, yes, yes. I will try to set the clock so that we can uh, meet that uh, time requirement. Uh, so basically, um, I have uh, about six points uh, to be exact. So I would like first to first thing first to put the South China Sea uh, dispute in perspective. And I have to remind that uh, maybe in the 2000s, uh, when I start working on the, uh, on the topic, and everyone talking about the peaceful rise of China. And then later we talk about the peaceful development. And um, I think that uh, at that time, uh, when I discussed with all the scholars and politicians on that matter, nobody believed that uh, any kind of uh, conflict and maybe war could happen in that area. Although the South China Sea had been a flashpoint for decades. Uh, but I think since 2009, I think the narrative changed. And uh, we see the more of the words assertive, coercive. And I think that uh, for the period 28 and 29, uh, 2020, I uh, know 27 and 29. Uh, so the Vietnamese are the first country to born the uh, blunt of the assertiveness. And thus it become the South China Sea can become a test case for the thesis of China peaceful rise or maybe peaceful development. So a number of questions going to inside uh, come to mind now. I think we already have uh, more than one or two decades to observe the rise of China. The key questions then uh, are, uh, what is the China intent or the objective in the South China Sea? What is its approach or maybe its strategies and what are the impact on the broader regions? And I think the questions are very important because, you know, with, well, from what we observe from the South China Sea, uh, also subsequently we happen in other parts of uh, the regions, especially in the East China Sea or also maybe in the Himalayas, when we see different type of pattern of behavior will be continuous or maybe or duplicate one way or another. So I think the study of South China Sea and how it's subsequently involved very important for us to understand. Uh, because it's one the rising of power 
but also it pattern the behavior and how it subsequently uh, impact the border regions. Now for the first question regarding to the intent and objectives, I can be very quick. Of course, we see many types of interests uh, I mean, objective from the Chinese side. Of course, there would be the terrorize the land, uh, the insular features in the middle of the sea, and which we believe that is not much uh, value in terms of the land. But of course, it's a side of uh, the territories. Of course, also the people assert that the China won uh, resources, especially the fish on hydrocarbon resources um, in the continental cells of many countries in the regions. Uh, there's also the idea that the China will seek the sea control, especially to uh, monopolize the control over the strategic greater way that carry about 30% of the uh, of the global trade go through that region. And I think that is a, subsequently that kind of strategic control will lead to the enhance the influence of China's on that operations. But I think that all that uh, uh, objectives or maybe the interest is not enough to explain the situation. China's have maybe more larger ambitions, especially not only it want to assert the dominations over the region, it means that it seeks the submissions of the neighboring country. But I think that um, that even not enough, what China maybe aims trying to change the rules. Now, I don't want to mention about the rules by order, I don't think that the cliche, but of course we have the, some set of rules, but the China want to change it. So it's not about the changing state of course, uh, on the at, uh, uh, at the sea, as many people mentioned, but definitely what the people in the strategic circle in Beijing may think that, I mean, finally that the rules have been changed. So we set a, we set a, a, we set a rules, the own clause that con we con consider at the constitution of the sea, the China changed it. But also I think that there are the rules as well regarding to how the country and state behavior. Now how the China do it and how China achieve that objective in the South China Sea. Now, I think we have to make it right because if we don't understand how it worked out, it's very difficult for us to respond it rightly or maybe to depict other country to respond to that. And somehow that we don't know how that we lose the ground. But for my, my research, so some kind of keywords have propped up, of course, especially that gray zone. That may mean that China will I mean the threshold between war and peace. And also we have come up with some idea that uh, the hybrid warfare because it involved in many elements of the powers, not only the military, but also economic and also civilians. We also frequently heard about three warfares, it's the information warfare, legal warfare, and psychological warfare, which is also uh, played out in the region. Of course, also that we talk about the possible use of force to achieve that one. But I think from my perspective, from my own research, uh, I did write a good paper on that, so I'd like to recommend to that. But um, I would try to, of course, I sorry to become for become a little bit academic on that. Of course, we can talk about the balance of power and the balance of threat. But I think that that two concept of power and threat would not depict rightly what happened in the South China Sea. But I think it better we use the concept of risks. The risk is combinations of possibility and consequences. And that the game that China play in the region is not, you know, use the threat or power, but I think to leveraging on the uh, uh, Cap Clement state, but also other external powers who may have the rise uh, in the region. How that it worked out, I mean, that the risk uh, a combination between the possibility and also consequences. And when the risk of war, the risk of breaking down of relations, the risk for, I mean, involved in something in the intense great power competition. So what the rich China has posed to other countries is first thing first, the China pulled very expensive claims that are not in line with international law, manifest in the 9-9 that many people, the uh, infamous 9-9 many people know about 90%. Of course, that have no ground in 
in uh, in international law. Of course, also China claims to the insular features in the region. Uh, the Spratly and the Prasels are relatively weak vis-a-vis uh, -vis those of Vietnam and other country. But anyway, that China puts up um, very big claims over there. The second one, of course, that claim is not in line with UNCLOS, with the rules that we are many other country place. So how that they can they push for the claims? So they not only use the military deterrence, but also to use a set of Coast Guard and military militia, that is civilian forces, to impose, to, I mean, to, to flood the ground, and to maintain presence and also to uh, to pushing the envelopes. Of course, many people just think about the Coast Guard and mil uh, maritime militia. But of course, you know that um, the military deterrence, I mean, the big worship is at the core of the uh, uh, intimidating other countries. To, perf to support, you know, that kind of operation on the ground, China also utilized three warfares. That's the psychological warfare, that the um, legal warfare, and also information warfare. First one to to influence, to shape the public opinion on that, also to change, you know, to put their legal narrative in the region in own way. Uh, what happened in the uh, play out in the region? We also see some element of economic warfare in place that China, in, you know, use a uh, independence or maybe dependence of other country to to forces. They also, we see the political and diplomatic tools employed of course, in various bilateral negotiations and also for the negotiations on the code of conduct in the region. So I think that uh, in, uh, in a snapshot, China pushing the envelope in own funds. So it's not just about the uh, uh, on the ground, but also in the political, in diplomatic, in economic, and also uh, in the legal front as well. So it goes to the third point and how that affect the other country in the region. Of course, I would I classify into three groups. So the first one, the direct involved, I mean, are the claimants, because they are facing the hard choice. If you defend things, you will rise seriously. Of course, you are in the risk of direct confrontation with the Chinese. Um, and of course, you know, it's very hard to confront the big Coast Guard and huge number of maritime militia ship in the region without resorting to force. But if you resorting to force, uh, you are facing the risk of escalating. And of course, uh, whether you consider your small neighbor, a uh, small side of the equation, you try to defend your rights, or you have to be coerced on that. That is very difficult. But I think that so far, that as a country trying to push up, no one to willing to give up their rights. But of course, it tried to one doing a different way to manage the rich to work with the rich in a very appropriate way. And I think the, the second one is the, whether it affect, you know, the regional group, especially ASEAN, but many blame on ASEAN not working enough on that. But of course, ASEAN, it is is not to counter the big power politics. It try to work out way to preserve peace. But of course, for the minor, uh, for the thing that is about the rules, uh, and also those uh, play out in the region. Uh, it's very hard for the smaller grouping to be, uh, to work under that kind of pressure. But I think that so far, China, uh, ASEAN managed to work with the basic, very low common denominator in terms of peace and stability. Uh, but in terms of when we're going to deal with the code of conduct, there's also big risks that it be, can be divided and, and of course it's not, can force the common voice on the critical issue with the getting to what happened on the ground and also what how the rules should be played. And I think the third group of country, especially the other powers who have the rights in the region, um, is under the also great risk to be boxed out in the region because uh, I mean that China's trying to impose, uh, try to put into kind of rules that the uh, claimants of a regional country not involve other power in the region, either in hydrocarbon exploitation, exploration, and also the military uh, activities. And I think that is, um, I think other countries try to exert their rules, but they, if they don't pay subsequently sufficient attention to the rights and entitlements of coastal states, especially other claimants, 
So they basically live at the claimants and coastal state at the risk of being coerced by China because subsequently the, the, the interest, I mean, other countries have to weigh the interest, whether they have to work on that. But uh, after all, at the end of the day, the international rules may order, but the existing one is the interest of everyone. So other countries, they should, uh, the especially big power with the big uh, responsibility uh, should avoid the concerns and also to avoid against any kind of unlawful claimants and maybe also illegitimate activities uh, and work together with each other to maintain it. Otherwise, it's very difficult for what we're working on. So basically that um, my uh, three or four observation on what happened in the South China Sea. And I think the South China Sea have brought the uh, implication for the region and of course from that, I mean, we see some better behavior will be be encouraged or maybe to have, you know, they see that how it worked now and apply in other region and so. Uh, so we we have the a problem and uh, it's better to work out collectively and in the way that it could be helpful to maintain a peace and stability, but also the rules we have or otherwise it will be the region will be flung in the chaos. Thank you very much. That, and I open to any questions of that. Thank you, Dr. Thon Hai. Please give him a round of applause. Thank you. Dr. Khare, may I request you to please... Uh, yeah, if you could please uh, coordinate the question and answers. Yeah. Uh, there are a few questions. Uh, yep. Hello. There are a yes. few questions. Uh, Professor Srikant Paranchu wants a question. Please, sir, you come here. Uh, this is a quick question about South China Sea. Am I correct? If my understand is my understanding correct that ASEAN would like to negotiate with China on South China Sea as ASEAN as a group, but China would like to negotiate with countries which are essentially literal countries of ASEAN of South China Sea individually, bilaterally, rather than negotiate as a group. Is this understanding correct? This one. Should I answer it? I'm waiting for a couple of uh, questions. Yeah. Uh, question. Any other question uh, from audience? Because uh, is living. So, okay. uh, if I may uh, ask a on, question, sir. as a chairman, uh, you are trying to rebalance your uh, relations with China, as we can see. Uh, what exactly are your concerns about the, you know, not joining maybe the, uh, you know, the Quad or AUKUS or whatever else that the U.S. would like to have in this region? So I think, uh, thank you, that led to uh, important questions um, that posed to me. I think the first thing first about the ASEAN, those how China to deal with uh, what China prefer and also insist for quite a wide the bilateral um, uh, engagement and negotiations to settle. Of course, we all understand, you know, with bilateral relation and if you are the smaller power in the equation, because it, it's very hard to resist, you know, the political power. Uh, but of course, in subsequently from the, in the middle of the uh, 1990s, China also accepted, you know, ASEAN with some role in managing the dispute, if not resolving, right? So of course, uh, China discussed with ASEAN to set up with the aim to establish the code of conduct. And finally, they got the declaration of conduct. Of course, you know, with the uh, ASEAN, so there are two maybe format. The first one with ASEAN versus China. And the second one is one versus one. But the second model is 11, uh, 10, 11 countries negotiating with each other. So basically with the format now, I think that uh, with the way it does, it's usually we see that 11 country to negotiate each other for the rules may order for the for the for the rules in the South China Sea or somehow. So rest of the outsider will be left out of the negotiating tables. 
And the, if they agree on some rules that it's not in line with what India or the US say that the, the rights of the third country. So that would be issue. So we we'll encourage India and other country to add, to articulate what is what you want and what is the rules that other countries should adhere and to be specific, but whether the nice deadline is wrong, whether other thing is wrong. So I think that basically that it, that stating their rights and their position that also helping the negotiation um, within this grouping with China to take into account of the opinions and the articulations of other countries as well. So the South China Sea, as we see, is not any sea belong to any one country, but I mean, it it is the uh, global commons and everyone have to comply with the uh, the rules that already agree upon. And the second one with the Quadranocus and Vietnam position uh, uh, to that, Vietnam articulated many times is for no, police, uh, for no pol uh, policy. The first one is no military alliance with other country. The second one is no uh, foreign military basis in, on, on Vietnam. The third one is no going one country against others. The third one, no first use of force. And I think that is based on formulated, formulated based on our history and our experience with the world. The country has experienced many wars in the past. And we believe that kind of military alliance would help. So we generally want to build and consolidate peace and stability in the region based on rules. Uh, so that's the reason why we continue to construct engagement with all the stakeholders in the region and how to work down the way to secure peace but still, you know, to preserve our rights, especially the rights uh, and entitlements of the claimants and also the other country in the region. Yes. Thank you, that was very nice. Uh, any other question before the, the Honorable Dr. Thai Hai leaves? Thank you, sir. You could uh, disconnect if you wish and take on your next engagement. Thank you on behalf of the uh, organizers. Thank you very much and sorry very much. My apology for leaving early because I have next engagement uh, in two and I hope that you know, can keep, keep on exchange on that. And I Okay, a round of applause for him. Thank you. The next speaker is Mr. Jim Wilson, who's at the moment in Kuala Lumpur in the US Embassy, a China expert. And of course on Taiwan, he has a lot of issues, but uh, before he begins his, I just want to just throw in a couple of questions about, you know, the Chinese are, as uh, Dr. Ambassador Mabavale said, are just trying to, and even Jai Rane talked about aping US in every possible way to try and get to that goal of 2049 to be equal or if not surpass US as the world number one. And that's their strategy from Pax America to Pax Serica. So that is one part. Second is about, uh, you know, our, uh, as India is a partner in uh, the Quad, but Quad somehow is not moving really much. We don't really see much attraction. But however, Chinese are worried that India joined the Quad. And of course, they worry about AUKUS, which is a very Anglo-Saxon uh, unit, which has happened. So uh, may I now request you to take uh, 15 minutes to explain your position. Sure, absolutely. And, and thank you so much, sir, for that great introduction. Uh, it's really, really great to be here with you all today and also to uh, to Dr. Tanghai for his his excellent comments it was very, uh, very interesting. So yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity today. You know, my name is Jim Wilson. I, I cover regional China issues at the US Embassy in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Uh, I work with our embassies and with US embassies and consulates in the six countries of maritime Southeast Asia. That is to say, Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, Philippines, Timor-Leste and Brunei on the full spectrum of, of PRC uh, investment and influence. Um, in in South, southeast asia you know while while india is not my my usual area of responsibility i'm still very honored to join you all today and i would like to pass on the regards of my colleague dan glosser who covers the same issue set that i do but based out of the u.s embassy in new delhi and 
who many of you may, may know already. Uh, as for our discussion today, um, you know, first of all, congratulations on a fantastic conference. You know, any of the topics on the agenda from China's strategic objectives, South China Sea, influence operations, these are all things we could spend days discussing. And, and sir, to your question about um, the China's broader strategic objectives and, and where we see uh, where we see China moving, you know, I, I think that dovetails very closely with with sort of the notes that I prepared. As I, I found myself preparing for today's session, you know, I thought it might be useful to spend just a few seconds talking about some of the trends in PRC's domestic governance that we see as underlying or driving its more assertive stance abroad, and that forms some of the connective tissue between that assertiveness on on a whole range of issues uh, external to China. Uh, you know, the first trend I think that, that we would uh, highlight is the growing prominence of nationalism within the PRC system over the last 10 years. You know, under Xi Jinping's tenure, not only has the PRC's economic and military buildup given it the, the capacity to be more forward-leaning and assertive abroad, uh, the growing emphasis uh, domestically within the PRC, both in terms of public messaging and also in terms of Kind of government communications and party communications it really is on achieving what they term as the great rejuvenation of the Chinese people, which is a key aspect of Xi's broader agenda that would have the PRC taking more concrete steps to realize its external ambitions on, on a whole range of issues. Um, another trend which I, I do think it's important to highlight is the growing sublimation of what we would consider as is the government governing institutions of China to to party institutions and to the direct control of the Chinese Communist Party? Uh, you know, while it's never been in doubt uh, that the party state, that in the party state the CCP is ultimately in charge. It, you know, a key aspect of the Deng Xiaoping reforms post reform and opening late 1970s 1978 was this idea of Dang Zheng Fen Kai or uh, separation of the party and the government. You know, this model was explicitly intended to help prevent the overconsolidation of power and ensure that technocratic decision making on key areas like management of the economy or pandemic prevention, or in many cases foreign affairs, that these things would prevail over what one might term as broader political concerns. Uh, the reassertion of control over day to day government functions that we've seen has been happening at pace throughout Xi's term. You know, one example which stands out to me, uh, which is specific, but I think is illustrative, uh, was the 2018 overhaul of, of uh, supervisory bodies within the PRC system that had functions over anti-corruption and good governance. You know, in 2018 in particular, there was a merger between the previous government ministry of supervision, which oversaw uh, the conduct and over conducted oversight over ministries with the party's central discipline and inspection commission. Uh, which maintains discipline for CCP members into a, a new body called the National Supervisory Commission, which is equal on paper to the PRC Supreme Court, but blends uh, previously separate party and government functions together. Uh, you know, this is a very clear, I think, illustration of the kind of merging that we've seen of party and leadership priorities with government functions. And, you know, this trend has been true throughout Xi's tenure, uh, but it, it does seem to have accelerated since last October's 20th Party Congress. Another quick example that I'll cite, which I think is quite interesting, um, is the, the conclusion, after last week's conclusion of the annual high-level two meetings policymaking sessions, the uh, the PRC announced changes to the rules governing its state council, which is the executive body in, uh, of the National People's Congress that oversees central government ministries as well as provincial governments. You know, under the revised rules, party control over what is nominally the highest governing institution in the PRC that's supposed to be separate. Um, you know, there's a uh, we see a significant change that uh, to what is supposed to be nominally a parallel government structure to the party structure. And and finally, as a third trend, I'll touch on briefly on something which I, I think many of you will be familiar with already, but but does bear emphasizing. You know, the co consolidation of Xi's political authority within the party. The gradual erosion of the, this collective leadership model of party governance, which is, was a hallmark of the reform and opening era, and which was specifically intended to uh, avoid the emergence of a single leader who could dominate the system. You know, last year's 20th Party Congress, last October, was very illustrative in that regard. You know, Xi Jinping succeeded in his bid to secure a precedent breaking third term in office and removed supposed factional balance at the highest levels of PRC leadership. Uh, sidelining individuals who are widely considered to represent different constituencies and elevating his own loyal to, loyalists. 
Um, she also allowed select individuals to remain in their positions past customary uh, retirement age norms, including now state councilor and recent foreign minister Wang Yi, whom I'm sure many of you will have uh, been observing very closely for a number of years, as well as the Central Military Commission Vice Chairman Zhang Youxia, uh, in large part due to their close association with Xi. Uh, you know, taken together, we, we see these trends as representing over time a significant shift towards more ideological governance which emphasizes the PRC's patriotic prerogatives abroad and, and has removed some of the institutional guardrails towards, towards one-man rule. Uh, they represent significant shifts in the PRC system, which, which will, we believe, allow for more assertive external behavior across a whole range of issues, behavior which forms the basis, I think, of many of the discussions today on more specific issues. Um, you know, I'll stop there with the internal analysis of the PRC, but I think, you know, it, on any number of issues in which the PRC now is more assertive, and as as the previous speaker, Dr. Tanghai, uh, uh, elaborated so so well, um, you know the PRC really is pushing to change change the existing rules of of the road on things that have been largely agreed upon. I think it's within that context that coordination among like-minded groups or among uh, among groups like the Quad. It's really essential, you know. We we see this, you know. We see the Quad not just as not as being explicitly linked at containing China. Of course, we don't seek to contain any single country, but we do see the Quad's vision uh, for the region, where there's a rules-based order that is upheld, where principles of freedom, rule of law, democratic values, peaceful settlement of disputes, sovereignty, that these things are respected. And we see the constituent members of the Quad. You know, India, uh, India, of course, but also Japan and Australia is being uh, uniquely able and positioned uh, in terms of capability to help maintain those that free, open, inclusive uh, Indo-Pacific. So, you know, I, I think contextualizing domestic changes in PRC is very important. I will say just anecdotally in my discussions here in Southeast Asia, you know, there are many, many people who are looking at China's external behavior on a whole range of issues. But I, I think that there are not as many people looking at the domestic drivers of PRC's behavior. I think it bears in mind some of the some of the internal incentives within the PRC that are driving kind of its action, its sort of actions on South China Sea, Cross Straits, and others. So with that, I'll stop there. Happy to answer more specific questions, but hopefully that was that was useful. You know, every time I get thinking about more specific, complicated issues you know, among the what PRC would consider its core issue set of key issues implicating what it considers its sovereignty. I think it's worth remembering kind of the, the internal incentive structure there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. We'll have the question answered at the end of all the speakers. Is that right? Please. So please stay on. Great. The next next speaker is um, Dr. Roger Chi Feng Liu from Taiwan. Although he's presently in Pune and on the stage there, he's at the Flame University, a very renowned uh, professor of Stasia. And he's also been in uh, India for long now. So before he starts, I just have one question. You know, while your ex president visited uh, China and Shanghai yesterday, the current president is also visiting USA. And she is uh, not very happy with this particular visit that has happened because she has taken the clue from Hong Kong where the Chinese are talking about reunification in this way of one nation, two systems. But she knows that it is not happened so in Hong Kong. So uh, you think that the, you know, is that is that the way that the Taiwan would continue to look at? And also about your relations with USA, whether they will really put their foot, foot on the ground or will just say, like Ukraine, keep giving you lots of arms and ammunition. Uh, thank you, Chair. Should, should I answer the question first or? No, no, it could be part okay. of your. All right. Um, first of all, I would like to thank um, Mr. Ranade and um, uh, Namrata for inviting me here uh, along with the CCS. And uh, I'm happy to see uh, Professor Kari of DDSS. And uh, I, haven't, I haven't come back here for a while. I hope in the future I will have more opportunity to interact. And uh, Ambassador Bambavale, also uh, I would like to uh, extend the thanks and uh, gratitude to him. And it's very nice to see old friends and new friends here. And along with my students, we, I brought uh, five people coming. Um, 
Well, I have shared some of the things uh, in the, uh, I'm currently teaching understanding uh, politics of China. So I, I, I have to repeat some things that we have discussed before here. I hope you don't find it very uh, boring here. Um, first of all, uh, Taiwan. People are caring about Taiwan. And what will happen in Taiwan for the following few years or months will actually is um, the focus of yeah, it attracted, uh, it has attracted the attention from different parts of the world. And people are making guesses. So as a national who had family and friends residing in Taiwan now, well, it will inevitably, you know, create some bias of my evaluation. And um, well, of course, I hope there will be no war happening in Taiwan because that will be a disaster for my friends and families, the closest people. But uh, what will happen in Taiwan, according to the military intelligence or the high level US officers, they believe that uh, during the year of 2024 or 2025, it's more likely that a opportunity window of war will be open um, for the war in Taiwan across the Taiwan Strait. Uh, but I would like to make my guess, which can be biased, that I would like to uh, um, talk about here in the first, to put here in the first place. I think military options or the military ways or means will only be put as a supporting mechanism from the Chinese side. I have written an article for China Report uh, published by ICS in Delhi, in which I laid out four different uh, ways that China has been using to uh, tackle Taiwan, the CCP's um, Taiwan policy. There are four parts, the carrot, the stick, the net, and the needle. The carrots are promised benefit or attraction based on positive values offered by the Chinese side. The stick are military actions or threat, blockades and coercive policies, international politics, etc. The net refers to the relation network and the united framework or to develop local collaborators from the Chinese side, while the needle is infiltration, sabotage, and disinformation warfare. And I would like to say that, well, based on my uh, biased evaluation, for the following years to come, needle will be in the center of the Chinese policy towards Taiwan, supported by the net and carrots, while the stick will be the last option. Well, we're talking about Taiwan here, and uh, like uh, Ambassador Bambawule had mentioned, well, China is replicating everything, everything good in the US try to create an image that they're going to take over US as number one in the world. And uh, the netizens of China like to joke about that the POA is the biggest fan of the US armed forces. They are almost copying everything from the US forces. But now I would like to refer a little bit back to Sun Tzu and the art of war, right? Um, well, this is an uh, out of dated um, um, reference to that because um, there was, if you remember, uh, for the past few decades, there, was, there has been an obsession from the US part especially, that the Ch old China hands, um, they like to refer to Sun Tzu to attribute everything of the Chinese uh, military or strategic thinking back to Sun Tzu. But it's not like that. But um, well, the old wisdom song also still makes some sense for now. Sun Tzu has referred to um, the attack of, or the, um, um, the uh, how should I say that? The reference of the military goals. So therefore, four stages. He said, the highest form of generalship is to balk the enemy's plans. All right. If we put it, if we modernize it, well, the best way to take Taiwan with will be with great strategies among great powers, uh, or th even through the United Front work. Let the fortress to crumble inside. That will be the best strategy. And the next best is to prevent the junction of en enemy's forces, or uh, to to put it in a modern sense. Through diplomacy and alliances, well, China will be able to divert and uh, reduce the power of um, its um, um, enemies' allies on the other side, like Quad or other things. 
And the third is to attack an enemy's army in the field, right? So that's a third uh, uh, option. And the worst policy will be is to be besiege the wall cities, which is to take over Taiwan directly by force, right? And, and, and according to Sun Zi, the rule is not to besiege war cities if it can be possibly avoided, right? So that's the last option that China will use. Well, if we modernize it, it makes much sense. First, the cost of war is still high in modern uh, warfare, right? It's not easy, it's never been easy to take over an island by force, even for now, right? And uh, for China's international image, to be a belligerent guy uh, among the three new axis power is not a good thing to do for Xi Jinping. While his best buddies, Vladimir Putin and Kim Jong-un has been belligerent for all the time, all right? So the best strategy is for China to place the role as a peacemaker. And the last thing is from the inside. Xi, Jinping's, Xi Jinping has, his biggest concern is his own political security or he liked to refer to as the war scenario mindset, the xian si wei, all right? So war will be uncontrollable. If he tried to resort to, to war, I think that would be the last resort that he was forced to do it. So if he, that is to say, if he has other choices, I don't think he will be opting for war. Um, there are many things that China can use. The United uh, from the United Front Warfare is, or UFW is one. And uh, China tried to divert Taiwan through political means from the inside. Like Chair has mentioned, um, currently the president, uh, the former president Ma ying has been, now he's visiting China, all right? And this can be viewed as part of the UFW uh, launched by the CCP. Um, if, you, if you're interested, you can check the details of Ma ying schedule, where he is visiting, and what each location means. Well, he will be visiting the tomb of Dr. Sun Yat-sen, the founder of the ROC, or Republic of China, right? And then he will be visiting uh, the memorial of the Nanjing Massacre, which took place December the 12th of 1937, right? And then he will be going back to his hometown where, where his father is act was actually from, Xiangtan, Hunan, all right? And Hunan is also the cradle of almost all the important revolutionary leaders in CCP, including Mao, all right? And then he will be going to um, Chongqing, which is used as the second capital, fighting against the Japanese. The KMT government was forced to relocate to Chongqing to escape the bombardment of the Japanese um, air force, well, not air forces, but the, 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 naval, uh, the, the, the army aviation, all right? And then he will be going to the Central Party School, now becomes National Zhengzhi University in Taiwan. And, um, and National Zhengzhi University was long viewed as the party school of the KMT. And finally, he will be going to uh, major universities to talk with the younger generation of China, all right? So if we put it all together, what CCP has been trying to do is to form a united front with KMT, their old time enemy, all right? To re revive the historical uh, memories with the, their old enemies, to create a united front against the DPP, which is in the government for now. Why, why are they doing that? Because they want to influence the result of the coming elections, right? Taiwan is going to have a presidential election on Jan, in Jan 2024. And according to the pendulum pattern that has taken place for the past few decades, KMT will be in power for eight years, followed by DPP eight years, KMT eight years, and DPP eight years. Now we are at the end of DPP's eight years. So if you want to make the best bet, KMT is going to come back to power. What they need is the image of their capability to deal with CCP to maintain the cross trade peace. And this is what CCP is doing and offering to their old time enemy KMT, wishing them to win the next election so that they will have some political leverage to do for the future. And who is going to run in for KMT? 
well, Hou Youyi, the uh, current uh, mayor of the new Taipei city, is one. But what people fear the most is Terry Guo, the founder of Foxcom. All right, he is the best shot that will win representing the KMT. And CCP, well, inevitably, well, needless to say, have a lot of business leverage to him, right? So if they can um, influence Taiwan via uh, political or gray zone tactics or strategies, why they are using military options? So I would say that military option is like the supporting role that plays a very important, as a very important element inside of the total needle strategy of everything. Now DPP, now a CCP or the Chinese Communist Party has infiltrated in different aspect or part of the Taiwanese societies. Not only political parties, they even reach out to the DPP or the Pan Green supporters, the supporters of the Taiwan independence. They try to produce some of the benefit through the agricultural market to those farmers who supported DPP for a long time, all right? They reach out to the um, religious organizations, which plays a very important role in political mobilization in Taiwan and try to get hold of them. They reach out to the youth by, um, you know, pro with promises of bigger market, entrepreneurship, and all the support if you want to have your own company. And finally, they reach out to the media, trying to um, provide the growing image of China to those news organizations. So DPP is, uh, sorry, CCP is everywhere, all right? Uh, using with their uh, UFW, they are so far has been successfully control some part of the Taiwanese society, all right? So in this situation, I don't think they are eyeing for uh, military operations for now, but there are still possibilities like um, um, one of the panelists, I, I, I remember it's um, Mr. Rana that has mentioned that most likely if CCP or the POA is going to launch military operations in um, on the territories of the ROC or Taiwan, two places are most likely. The first is the Pratas Islands in uh, the northern part of South China Sea. The second is Ituaba Island in the Spratly Islands, all right? Ituaba Island is very far away from Taiwan. It takes like three to four hours to reach by air. So it's hard to defend. But Pratas Islands is between Taiwan, uh, uh, well, POA will, it will be easy for POA to cut it through, to cut the supplies between Taiwan's um, support uh, towards the Pratas Islands. And that place is not very um, close to, it's not in the center of the South China Sea. So if P POA is going to attack Prat um, Pratas Islands, that will be easier. First, they will send out a signal to the Taiwanese government that we are able to take part of your territory. Secondly, they can do it, they can send out the signals to other audiences, including ASEAN countries or the possible potential U.S. allies like the Philippines that the U.S., if they want to come to rescue, it will, it will not happen or it will happen in a very difficult way. So what will India do in this scenario? I will say that um, there are several things that I would like to mention. First, I think India should enhance its involvement among ASEAN countries. That is very important. Uh, we have been active, we, we had been active for the past few decades. Uh, I remember I had a conversation with the ASEAN country, the diplomat. Uh, he, he told me that uh, they had high hopes uh, wishing India to evolve more into ASEAN affairs. But after 2015, they kind of gave up this idea because of the growing China, because uh, of the um, withdrawal of the US, and because of India's, well, reluctance, or you can put any word for that. So we kind of, of course, um, we have our own um, strategies to reach out to ASEAN countries. For example, we have been a uh, step up our relations with Vietnam for the past few years. I think this is something that we have to continue. But we have to notice now, especially uh, from the past year, um, Vietnam has improved its inter-party 
relations with China. What I heard is that Xi Jinping has sent a group of team or people from the party center of CCP to the party center of uh, uh, CP, uh, CPV, the, the Communist Party of Vietnam, to help them tackle corruption issues. So they are working together. If you read the news, you will find that the previous, um, there is a revolve um, and, and a, um, there, there's a revolve in the higher level of the Vietnamese um, government. So that actually is the result um, of the closer working with, between this, um, the two communist parties. Um, the last thing that I would like to put here is that I will go through the points very quickly. Well, I think India should be more visible by entering and presenting itself in the area, including the Taiwan Strait and South China Sea. Well, this has been referred by uh, the Vijay Gokhale in uh, one of his uh, remarks before, because uh, the South China Sea and Taiwan Strait has very important business um, interests for India. So India should make uh, the legitimate claim. And um, the last thing is that I think India should step up its uh, collaboration with Taiwan. Well, we don't have to reach out to um, military, sensitive military areas, but we should focus on scientific research, including uh, ocean, oceanography, fishery, and marine biology. India should be presenting itself in South China Sea and in Taiwan Strait in the name of scientific research. This is totally legitimate, and this is totally doable. And this will offer us a place to go if there is a war taking place between Taiwan and China and all the other countries. Thank you. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. That was a very, very articulated uh, position of Taiwan and very nicely covered. Thank you very much. And now I request uh, Dr. Arvind Kumar to please uh, take uh, about five minutes to reflect on the speaker's audio on views. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also thank Mr. Arde and uh, Professor Khare for inviting me and giving me this opportunity. We have had excellent presentation on some of these very contentious issues, that is South China Sea and Taiwan. I would like to reflect some of these, largely in the context of uh, emerging challenges which China has been overthrowing to the rest of the world. The strategic importance of South China Sea, as was highlighted, really lies in the fact that it is a connecting link between the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. And that perhaps speaks volume about why China has been behaving the way they have been behaving. They would like to have a strong hold on South China Sea. Their claims, obviously, are not legally correct. But the, the way they really have been showing the sign of uh, transitioning from being assertiveness to aggressiveness in South China Sea is disturbing. And how is that could really be, uh, in fact, uh, creating a lot of challenges for the other countries in uh, that part of the world. As you know that uh, through South China Sea, China has got penetrated into Indian Ocean region. And that perhaps is again one uh, a sign of worry for India in particular. And uh, many other issues, obviously, with regard to the global trade, because the two thirds of global trade passes uh, through this particular South China Sea. And more importantly, the protection and the security of the sea lines of communication, uh, stretching from the states of uh, Malacca to the states of Hormuz, that also is a part of responsibility. So I think South China Sea uh, is obviously a, is, is a dispute which China does not believe in and has been trying to mobilize international public opinion in their favor. More importantly, those nations which have been a part of Clement such as Vietnam, which is a dominant uh, claimant in South China Sea. Other countries really somehow, uh, China has been able to convince them, but uh, it's not in consonance with the larger global uh, uh, peace and stability requirement. One aspect which really had come from Professor Pranjipe that uh, whether ASEAN can come up with a solution to this uh, South China Sea, I think, I think it is very easy for China to negotiate with ASEAN on South China Sea, but that again will not be viable, especially in the context of the assertion which Vietnam has been making in particular. Philippines, for that matter, obviously, to a larger extent, uh, has been uh, in line with the larger argument which China has been making, but that obviously is something which uh, remains a part of the challenge. The debate which really happened in the morning, especially that how the global order has been under transition from Pax Americana to Pax Sinica, I think is very valid in terms of understanding China's behavioral pattern, where China is heading to. 
In fact, the day China planned that they would like to own their own independent strategic program, I think Mao was very tough in terms of telling the members of Politburo way back in 1955, China cannot afford to get bullied by either of the power blocks. And that perhaps was the beginning of their strategic program. And they gave the reason and the rationale. And two of the major geopolitical rationale which they gave, one was the Korean War and third was the Taiwan, second was the Taiwan States crisis. And Taiwan States crisis still remain very dominant in all the discourses in geopolitics when we try to understand and infer what could really happen in uh, Taiwan States. So I think one thing which obviously has made it very clear that China obviously will keep uh, maneuvering militarily uh, despite the fact that uh, there are a lot of assertions which are being made with regard to reunification and all, that obviously uh, is, is something which is uh, a far distant reality because the threat of the US again will be, uh, in fact, impeding China's re realization of obviously uh, uh, invading Taiwan because that perhaps is preventing China uh, from invading Taiwan. So I think that is something which will keep happening. But in the same context, geopolitical context, China, in the meantime, what they will do is that they will keep evolving themselves as a strategic power, and that could obviously give them certain confidence. But more importantly, I think one thing we have to realize in the current context, that the nature of warfare will keep changing. It's not that their physical warfare is going to be a reality uh, in geopolitics, and that nature of warfare is going to be totally different. And in that context, I think most of the things which we are talking about with regard to China's force posturing, their uh, power trajectory, their force deployment, many of the aspects which they are doing is just to create a deterrent uh, against uh, the United States. And obviously that is going to work in terms of creating certain uh, balance in the region. Because uh, China has deployed, I don't know, since uh, uh, if I remember that uh, House Speaker uh, Nancy Pelosi's visit in August 2022, I think a lot of changes have occurred in terms of the way China has been unfolding its strategic maneuvering in uh, Taiwan. And that is something uh, is getting reflected because a lot of these military exercises that got augmented, again, missile launches which are happening, which is again a constant phenomenon. And obviously the increase in the number of their nuclear warhead to a larger extent, many of the things which is again coming up as a part of understanding is largely from the Western and the US source. But obviously one has to take it uh, uh, seriously in terms of their overall a growing role in uh, Taiwan, uh, particularly. So maybe I'll stop it here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, Marshal Soman, may I request you to also please make your remarks? Uh, a Marshal uh, Gokhale, esteemed panelists, today for this session. Uh, I think before I flag some points, I must comment on the predicament that the US faces in this particular topic that we have chosen, which is uh, the South China Sea crisis and uh, Taiwan. So as far as the US is concerned, I think they get involved in both. As far as South China Sea is concerned, they have to play the role of an offshore balancer where they need to sort of sustain the sovereignty and territorial integrity of the littoral states. And when it comes to Taiwan, they actually have to play the role of a defender. So having said that, I think I'll just very briefly comment on the DNA characteristics that have emerged uh, over the sessions. What are the aims of the Chinese and how are they going about it? So first and foremost, I think uh, there should be no doubt as far as the DNA is concerned that the Chinese have this middle kingdom kind of uh, attitude where they expect deference from everyone. Second is, uh, as per the, you know, the board game that the Chinese play, the Wai Chi, you know, which involves territorial kind of uh, position and capture, the Chinese are giving in to seeking territorial advantage whenever they get a chance. And the third is resort to punitive action as and when the countries do not defer to them. Now, having said that, I think the aim of China has, has come out very clearly is to replace the, is the, replace the United States as the most dominant uh, global power. And, uh, we continue to talk about uh, 
you know china china's rise i think china's rise has already taken place what we should be discussing as to where are they going to be going and how do we handle it now chinese have uh, you know their rise is very very clear you know they gained the economic clout during deng's time in those two three decades they converted that into military muscle from the military muscle they wanted to play the role of a hegemon which they are at this point of stage and from here on once they become the hegemon now they want to extend their influence into uh, the other parts of the globe uh, entrench themselves as a global kind of a superpower and then start to rewrite the rules of the world order it's not that uh, they are not writing their own rules they are already writing the rules any amount of uh, kind of uh, examples you know in the south china sea also in our case you know they've introduced this no new border law you know so they are writing their own rules but just please remember when they start to write the rules for the world what is going to happen you know in that case it will be that the strong will do what they can and the weak will suffer what they must okay very quickly coming to south china sea you know what's what's the importance of this first and foremost this 9 dash line which was uh, drawn by the kmt sometime in uh, 1947 the chinese want to claim territory over uh, uh, you know a position of this entire area you know and so there are certain problems that come up in terms of overlapping claims with uh, six countries now why is uh, china so interested in the south china sea the reasons are obvious they want to secure the near seas in terms of the south china sea first and then the east china sea and what do they get they get territorial gains they get to exploit the resources they control the strategic waterways that are there and most important what has been missed out is forward defense where they get a certain amount of strategic depth now even when you're talking in terms of south china you know you can imagine hainan island which is southeast of china where they have got a big submarine base Obviously, they want to have some kind of a strategic depth for the defense of this particular island. If that not be so, you can imagine, you know, foreign ships coming and sitting about 15 or 20 kilometers away from the coast as per the UNCLOS. Similarly, in East China Sea, the Senkaku Islands, they actually help the Americans to keep a track of the Chinese flotillas that move from East China Sea into the Western Pacific. Because you have that Mikoya Straits, which has a swath of about 250 kilometers. But if the Chinese do not have any control over Senkaku, then the problem comes up. They, you know, they go undetected, right? Uh, now, how uh, how have the Chinese actually? What have the Chinese actually been doing in South China Sea? You know, they've kept the conflict. I wouldn't say conflict. Uh, their engagements and violent actions below the armed conflict level where they avoid the risk of escalation. So what is the problem? The problem is that the Western countries, including the US, have no answers in terms of how to address this particular threat with conventional issues. Now, I'm not too sure. I just read somewhere, as per the uh, National Defense Authorization Act of the US, I believe on, under Article 1221, they can stand up, you know, they can establish, train, develop, and create certain forces, you know, uh, which are akin to the maritime militias, what we are talking about. Because the Chinese have a very set model. You know, they, they don't engage their conventional forces into any kind of engagement. It starts off with the fishermen, thereafter backed by the uh, maritime militias. And as a backstop, they have the Coast Guard as well as the US, uh, the Chinese Navy. So, Perhaps some kind of an answer will be need uh, will have to be found to that. Now, uh, uh, quickly switch, switching to Taiwan because uh, I really don't have time. But uh, something that was discussed was what is the likelihood of war, you know? And uh, I think uh, Roger very uh, correctly said that stick is going to be the last option, you know. And uh, uh, I, I quite agree with him. But when will that stick come? Is the question. You know, because uh, in the actually what is happening is, as far as China and US are concerned, both are waiting for the other side to decline. You know, the Americans are waiting for the Chinese to decline, you know, their power to decline so that, you know, this trouble gets over. But unfortunately, 
you know, that is not happening. And as far as the Chinese are concerned, they feel, you know, over a period of time, the American power is going to decline. And then perhaps the Americans will not have any stomach to come to the defense of Taiwan. And then the Taiwanese themselves will make their choices and cut arrangements with the mainland China. So that is the, that is the issue at hand. And secondly, when you talked about public uh, kind of uh, opinion, you know, you have two uh, political parties, the KMT as well as the DPP. The KMT was more pro towards uh, reunification and the DPP was more closer towards some form of uh, separation or independence. Both have burned their fingers, you know, and today the KMT doesn't talk in terms of reunification, neither does the DPP talk in terms of independence. And this has actually happened in the ballot box. So both these words, reunification as well as, as, well as uh, uh, you know, uh, the freedom have actually become ballot box poisons. You know, so everyone wants to stay away from it. They just want the status quo. They're quite happy with the fact that Taiwan is a de jure self-governing entity. The Americans are also happy with it, you know, as long as there is no trouble. So uh, all in all, I feel that uh, all sides actually are interested in status quo, you know. And uh, so with those, uh, I think, remarks, I will conclude, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sunil. That was very nicely spoken about uh, both the issues. And now may I request uh, Dr. Kare to please moderate the question and answer session. Uh, can you start uh, from this side, student side? Please. You, uh, please, come, you come here. Uh, can, you, can you use the mic? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I have two questions, uh, both for Professor Liu. Uh, one is this uh, gray zone warfare which uh, USA is carrying out against Taiwan is going on for a long time and it has got a tremendous effect on the uh, stamina of Taiwanese people as well as the economy. So first question that I want to ask you is, ki is, the chi uh, chi uh, is the Taiwanese economy suffering because of this uh, uh, gray zone warfare which China <coughs> is carrying out against you? And are there any cheaper ways of reacting to Chinese uh, 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 gray zone? For example, if they come with fighter aircraft, instead of replying by fighter aircraft, why don't you reply with, let's say, uh, drones, etc., which are much cheaper, you know, because they're wearing you down. Because one of the most important aims is to wear you down. Okay, so think of cheaper means of reacting to the gray zone tactics which China is using. That is one question. And second question is, you mentioned that the Chinese are carrying out subversion of the Taiwanese society. Uh, and uh, But there has been a recent report which says that this influence operations which China is carrying out against Taiwan are not succeeding. So I want to ask you a question. Is China going ahead with subvers uh, uh, is there subversive influence on the Taiwanese societies, be it in the media, be it in think tank, be it with common people, be it in economic uh, zones, etc. Is it increasing as compared to what it was earlier or it is decreasing as one research uh, report made out to be? Shall I take uh, one more question or Roger? Or you want to reflect? Uh, th thank you, sir, for uh, the very important question. Uh, the first is, are there any cheaper ways to counter the gray zone tactics from China? Um, yes, uh, we are a cheap island, island of chips. So um, we have, uh, Taiwan has been producing a lot of hackers and all these technicians. So they're very good at that. If you focus, you must know Audrey Tang who is like a, a minister with a portfolio in the, in the Taiwanese government. She has been really successfully, you know, tackled with uh, China's um, disinformation warfare by launching different form, uh, forms or formats or the platforms on the internet. So I think, um, you know, the Taiwanese technology actually is a very important part of the silicon shield that people talk about. The second thing is, 
What, how should Taiwan uh, respond to the um, subversive operations launched by China? I think one of the great thing that China, Taiwan has, especially after all uh, past few decades of our democratic, uh, democratization uh, ex experience and processes is that Taiwan has developed a very strong civil society in which we have different, uh, very sound groups of different with different political interest. Um, so uh, recently you will see that there are a bunch of people led by uh, the, the previous uh, chairperson, the founding um, uh, one of the uh, um, electronic tycoons, uh, Cao Xinchen. He has been, uh, Mr. Cao has um, promised to fund the Taiwanese campaign from the civil society to counter China as a military militia. So there was some, you know, um, forces in the society who like to dedicate themselves into uh, voluntary military trainings. And second thing is that we have this kind of cyber forces as well. So, um, and and uh, the Chinese, when the Chinese, um, the the fi uh, fifty cent army tried to spread some, you know, offensive attack on the internet forums. Actually, the civil society or other groups formed by the Taiwanese people will counter that voluntarily without the coordination of a government. So I think civil society and technology actually now has formed two very important line of defense for the Taiwanese society against Chinese attack. Thank you, Rajan. Uh, any, any other question from that side? Yeah. Please, uh, Abhishek, can you give a mic to them? Am I audible? I'm audible. Uh, my question is to Professor Liu. However, this is open to everybody on this panel today. Uh, on the 3rd of March, there was a report that Foxconn, and I'm glad Professor Liu mentioned Foxconn. Foxconn had came up with a deal with Apple where they announced that they would be creating factories in India, in Tamil Nadu, which created lakhs of jobs. Now, my question is that how do you see China responding to this since all the three parties involved, US with Apple, India with being the space this is happening, and uh, Foxconn, the Taiwanese company coming together, all these three parties don't exactly share the best relations with China, which is precisely why we are here. Uh, thank you. That's a very important question. Um, chip wars. People are talking about this. So uh, Foxconn has been very keen to set up the uh, factories in different parts of India. I think this is mainly on the business concerns. They don't. They are not part of the you know strategic uh, arms of the Taiwanese government or the U.S. government. So they care about themselves. Uh, what China will do? Well, I, I don't think China can do much about this, but ch what China has been doing is to strengthen itself. So China has been developing its line of assembly for uh, chips of you know, better technologies. So if you go back to check Make in China 2025, actually chip, um, you know, the manufacturing of chips is very important for the Chinese to have some technological uh, breakthroughs. Now China has been focusing the improvements on its 20 nanometer uh, chips or, or waffles, waffles, all right? And compare with um, TSMC, TSMC now has reached the three nanometer, three, not 28, all right? And now they are moving towards two nanometers, all right? So you will see the generational gap between China and Taiwan. So um, China doesn't care much about India. China is focusing on US and Taiwan especially. They want to take it over um, in the years to come. So I don't think that will be a big issue for, for I mean, strategically for, for China to worry. They want to focus on their se themselves for now. So could I uh, you know, have the audacity to rephrase my question a little bit? Is that okay? Yes. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. So uh, why I ask that is not from the perspective of chip wars, 
it is from the perspective of uh, job creations because that's exactly what Apple did for China for a very long period of time. So that is something that they were doing here in association with a country that they anyway don't get along with. So when I talk about that, I talk about an association that is, that is being created at the behest of creating multiple jobs, which is supposed to promote economic growth, which is keeping China out of the loop. That is why I was asking why, what, how do you think China will react to that? So let me presume your line of logic is that Foxconn has been closer to China and while they are creating jobs over here, they might be influenced by the government of China to withdraw that if something happens between China and India? No, Foxconn associating with Apple and with the Indian government to get permissions to set up factories here. That's my question. Uh, no, they, they don't need that. This okay. is a business decision. I think Erman uh, Bushan Gokhale, Hello. sorry. Uh, uh, so uh, answer will I, I, I think I'll just make a very brief comment on it. He has covered the Chinese part, but basically it's national interests. You know, by relocating, all that the all that the U.S. is doing is to bolster the resiliency of their supply chains. You know, either through diversification or creating redundancies, and that's a that's a natural uh, uh, you know a national call. So they won't really be worried about what the Chinese think about it, right? And it definitely helps us. Uh, give the mic. So, may, I, may I request Jim, uh, Jim also to say a few words. Gokhale sir, uh, there will be a few questions, we'll have it. Uh, okay. Uh, Ajit Ranadi sir will want to have one question. Yeah, thank, uh, thank you and uh, again thank you for an excellent session. This is a question for uh, all the panelists but Professor Roger may feel uh, free to lead the response. I, don't know, I think there's a feedback from here. See, the whole world is invested in the sovereignty of uh, Taiwan in the sense that uh, these 23 million people, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm struck by the fact that the size of Taiwan is the same as size of Sri Lanka. Uh, but of course, the per capita income is much higher. And uh, we talk about how the Chinese are trying to influence subversively the Taiwanese people to think that they are not, uh, you know, trying to take over Taiwan, but it's both the civilizations are one, culture is one, and we are one country. I'm thinking about uh, Hong Kong, which very slowly over a long period of time, it's become part of uh, China. So my question is the following. While on one hand, the Chinese may be resorting to subversive techniques to change social and public opinion, uh, maybe the Americans and others are also uh, in trying to influence the Taiwanese to stand up. And you know, this is not done, you know, even your different people, you, your sovereignty is important, you can't be taken over. Um, so do you see it in that way that the, basically Taiwan has now become a proxy ground for uh, the world which wants to not uh, let China succeed and therefore it is important for Taiwan to stand up and, and uh, protect its sovereignty and on the other hand uh, Chinese doing the opposite thing but the Taiwan is in the morning also I asked the same question. It's uh, it's not a very happy predicament. So I'm wondering what you know what is the uh, what is the see sense of the people of Taiwan? I'm sure it's fiercely debated. And again, I would like to refer to Hong Kong. What happened to Hong Kong? Hong Kong, of course, is about uh, about 10 million people. So it's half the size of China, Taiwan, and the same per capita income. So all for the whole panel, yeah. Sorry. No, the, the sovereignty of Taiwan is a big issue and the whole world is invested in that. But it is almost as if Taiwan doesn't have the agency for it. You know, uh, I was struck yesterday, uh, who was it, uh, who said this comment? Um, I think maybe it was the chief of the army who said that uh, you, can, you can determine your economic future, you can determine your political future, but you cannot determine your military future. It's almost as if the agency is taken out of the Taiwanese people. But it's a little contradictory because on one hand, we emphasize the sovereignty of the nation. So the nation should have the independence and the freedom and the autonomy to decide what the future is. But the whole world is invested saying that you don't have the agency. Uh, the, the rest of the world wants it to remain independent and the Chinese want it to be to fold it up without going to war. So I know it's a very sort of broad question, but any reaction from the panel would be welcome. Thank you. Roger. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, Taiwan sovereignty, the war has, okay. I, I, I think now Taiwan has been a 
becoming more and more important. Well, especially well, people. This is a, like a paradoxical, you know, thing. When U.S. is trying has been trying to play China card, Taiwan status just keeps going down, starting from Nixon, Carter, Reagan, you know, for until George W. Bush. Taiwan has been tagged as a troublemaker sometimes because it has been a way of the U.S.-China collaboration. But now the thing has changed. So I think the Taiwan, the situation in Taiwan Strait actually is like very paradoxical. When we are looking for peace, well, when it seems to be belligerent and full of war, actually there is a peace hidden inside. When, when we see the collaboration between the great powers for the Taiwanese, it's not safe at all. So I will say that this is a good timing for the Taiwanese to keep their sovereignties for now. Because like for the past few years, it is the Taiwanese people who want to stay independent and at least keep the status quo. But the great powers like US and China are not trying to let it happen. But now when US and China are standing against each other, Taiwanese people, although they are seem seemingly being put in a very dangerous situation, I would say that Taiwan has been in the safest timing for the past few years. And for the U.S., Taiwan cannot be lost because Taiwan is a symbol of the U.S. credibility of security in the East Asian or Indo-Pacific region. Taiwan is also for each and every government of the U.S the great symbol of the U.S. supported democratization of East Asian countries. If this kind of passion has been taken over, that will mean the total failure of the U.S., not only militarily, but ideologically. But for China, Taiwan has to be taken back because Taiwan first have two important things. First is national, nationalism, all right? Part of the nationalistic feelings, sentiments must be fulfilled. Uh, the great restoration of the Chinese people, the China dream of you know, Xi Jinping, it has to be fulfilled. Secondly, Taiwan has strategic values. So when these two things clashed, collided together, I don't know what will happen, but I can just resort to the fog of war. Um, somebody mentioned about this, like when the opportunity window of war has, has op opened, and we will resort that to the hands of God. You want, uh, please. Yeah. I think Jim wants to say something. Yeah. Dr. Khare? Yeah, just if I could just uh, open up. Yeah, Jim, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. just one other thing, you know, that's it's a very interesting question. I think there's a lot of ways that you could, uh, that you can approach that. And thank you very much to, to Roger also for the, the very thoughtful response. You know, I think one part of discussing the status quo in the, in the club trades that I think is really concerning, at least from a US perspective, are PR, the PRC's ongoing efforts to decrease Taiwan's international space and to isolate Taiwan internationally. You know, even from institutions in the UN system, which don't require statehood for membership. And I, I think that, you know, a key concern is part of that isolation process, I think, from the PRC's perspective, would increase its ability to take unilateral action across a variety of different, uh, different areas towards Taiwan. And so, you know, one thing I think that's really important, you know, from, once again, a U.S. perspective is... You know, working with friends and allies to maintain that space for Taiwan to kind of maintain our uh, broader economic and other ties, which not only benefit from the people of Taiwan, but also you know we can benefit from from the people of Taiwan. They're, you know, Taiwan is a global leader in health, in manufacturing, democratic governance, semiconductors, all of all of these things. So I think that's one thing that is as countries are looking at their own engagement strategies with with Taiwan, just keeping in mind that maintaining those international links really are vital because it really highlights Taiwan's current importance, but I think also means that it's not as easily isolated and in some ways may may provide its own effect or have an effect on the PRC's calculations with the Taiwan. Thanks. I just have a brief comment on this. Uh, one country, two systems, you know, I think uh, Taiwan has learned a lesson from Hong Kong that it's not really working. And the democracy, uh, which is very vital to Taiwan, is uh, being surfaced by, you know, uh, the communism that may come in in a, in a different garb if uh, Chinese take over Taiwan. 
Ya, Sudhir. Yeah, my sir. Sir, probably I'll just add on to what you have said. Uh, there was a certain kind of an equilibrium that had been reached between these three countries in terms of uh, you know maintaining status quo. But then uh, what happened was the Chinese started to realize that politically, culturally, and economically, the Taiwanese are getting drawn away from them. So that was one of the reasons. And the reason happened because of what the people from the KMT, who were more closer towards reunification, saw what happened in Hong Kong and the way the Chinese were treating the Uyghurs in Xinjiang. So uh, uh, coupled with that, what, what the Chinese realized is, is the Western powers, and particularly the Americans are taking a lot of initiative, the pa Pacific Deterrent Initiative. The Quad has also started to take on a life of its own, you know, basically because in, in all, all, most of these countries were ambivalent in their postures, but now with this aggressive designs of the Chinese, you find things have started to shift. Similarly with AUKUS. So keeping that in mind, the Chinese feel that they, if they don't act in the next five to six years, probably they just might lose out. And another important reason is that she has taken it upon himself as his personal legacy to reunify Taiwan. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I think one thing is very clear that the threat of the U.S. intervention features prominently on the US, on the Chinese strategy, and the way, in fact, China has understood the U.S. maneuvering in Taiwan. I think that is what is stopping uh, China from uh, invading Taiwan. That is one part, and the second thing also, which uh, is very critical in the current context, is the overall uh, growing assertion on part of China, and that perhaps obviously will keep, uh, uh, in fact, uh, China will keep maneuvering in many areas of at least showcasing their uh, strategic uh, development that could obviously dissuade the US again from the intervention. So I think it's again a very critical phase on geopolitics, especially in that part of the world. Thank you. Ah, Professor Dilip Moiti. Hello. Hello. Uh, this question is specifically to Mr. Jim Wilson. Uh, recently I heard that there is a strategy devised by the United States of America offshoring and in that connection there was a big uh, kind of a move to bring back the industries or investment from China to the United States of America. Now China has actually marched ahead with economic power basically, but they have not opted for any military alliances with anybody, except for the fact that probably we are guessing that China and Russians might uh, get together, but that is still in a very fluid situation. But what is important is that if United States succeeds in offshoring, in that case, what will be the effect on China? And do you think that uh, uh, US will be able to uh, block China from the economic perspective? Yes, Mr. Wilson. Well, thank you, sir. I think that's that's a great question. It's a, a question that's at the forefront of a lot of people's minds. You know, I, you know, the U.S. U.S. policy towards economic engagement with China, we, we're not going. I don't. We're not seeking to stop China's economic rise or to or fully divest from China. You know, U.S. companies have been deeply invested in China now for decades, and you know there are certain aspects of global manufacturing which I think. Are not easily replicatable, even if we were to spread supply chains out through uh, a number of countries. You know, I think what is happening at the moment is a reevaluation re of, in particular, for critical industries that have potential dual use implications. Um, that maybe, in some cases, like with the Chips Act, it or uh, in other uh, other measures that we've taken to redirect critical supply chains, that those things, you know, where the Chinese or the PRC has made it very clear. Uh, there are not only dual use implications, but also that they are willing to mandate companies share those technologies with uh, with the PLA and other entities that we should move some of those some of those technologies or push companies to relocate outside of China. I mean, I, I think I think for specific critical sectors that that is true. You know, I think, though, also it, it is worth keeping in mind that our collective experience 
just around the globe coming out of the pandemic was a good reminder that you know the previous system in which it was you know extremely lean supply chains that had no redundancy for for very critical industries that sometimes having extra extra room to maneuver uh, in crisis situations that that is uh, that is important and so you know I, I think that well we're not looking to divest entirely from the PRC we're not going to stop um, stop trading with the PRC I, we're not pushing all U.S. companies to remove investments I think it'd be immensely difficult you know in specific targeted industries I think there is a, a a desire to prevent particularly dual use technologies from falling into Chinese hands and to just introduce more more leeway into the global logistics system. I hope that's hope that's helpful. Thank you, sir. General sir. Uh -huh. Good afternoon. <coughs> I'm General Samanwar. I just want to bring in a, another perspective into this reunification and uh, its uh, various dimensions. Janice, can you uh, put on the mic? Uh, yeah. Loud. Uh, uh, I just want to bring in a new perspective, uh, a perspective into this uh, reunification. Uh, you see, when Formosa, when the KMT moved to Formosa, and, uh, Taiwan was created. Uh, there was a strong animosity between the two nations. Subsequently, it faded and a lot of people had their second families on mainland China. Now that generation that had families, second families, has, uh, is gradually fading away. What is now coming in is the new generation who want their own identity and they don't want to associate with the past. So there may be, uh, that may be another cause for the strong one nation, two nation theory. I'd request the professor to comment on that, if he could. Roger, this for you here. <laughs> the new generation versus the old. Um, yes, um, the KMT has brought two million of soldiers and their government along with a big constitution to Taiwan in uh, December 19, 1949. And while the time on the island of Taiwan, there are nine, uh, six million islanders. So it's like um, one fourth of everything. Um, yes, but now, the, well, generally speaking, the, the, the young generation Taiwanese had not viewed themselves as part of the Chinese. They cut off the Chinese lineage. They know that we speak the same language, we share the culture, but politically we're different. So I don't think that's an issue. But well, the new generation of Taiwanese actually are also a generation of realism or being realistic. They know that China means opportunity for them sometimes. And they know that if China want to attack them militarily, they will suffer a lot. So I will say that currently Taiwanese people has been thinking about the whole issue in a more realistic, realistic way. But I, I agree with you that this kind of generational change in politics actually helped Taiwan a lot to, to separate itself from China. But one problem is that historical legacy is still there. The Taiwanese armed forces has long traditionally been controlled by those from the mainland. The mainlanders and their descendants occupied, they had occupied the higher positions in the Taiwanese armed forces. So a lot of people have this kind of China nostalgic feelings. And these are the sector that the CCP has been working a lot. They invite those, you know, the retired soldiers, generals, or um, admirals and marshals back to visit China to attend the Wampoa military, Chinese military academy, 100th anniversary. They want to create this kind of united front with all those, you know, top brass or ex top brass in Taiwanese armed forces. And this is the part that BDPB has very few, I mean, very little capacity to infiltrate into the armed forces of Taiwan. Even for now, they have some trouble doing this. And I, I think this is one of the major concerns of the Taiwanese national security problem. Thank you. Last question for uh, South China Sea, not on Taiwan. 
<laughs> Thank you for a lovely uh, presentation. Uh, this is uh, regarding my experience of sailing for 25 years in the South China Sea, East China Sea, the Sea of Japan, actually all over the world. But right now concentrating on the actual thing which is happening in this part of the world, South China Sea. While it's all very nice to debate all these issues, what can the literal or the ownership com companies of the ships, and I was in tankers, this, uh, do if the Chinese tell you to stop and say that you go the other way around? Or when I was going through the Taiwan Straits, they say, please don't go this way, go around the Taiwans. Or lately, even in, uh, at, uh, you know, in the air, a Qantas aircraft was, uh, you know, sort of uh, filled around with. The GPS was turned off, the communications was uh, garbled. And so where do the literal states of this area and what did they do about it and where is the way forward? Because now it is becoming not academic, it is becoming on the ground. Thank you. Who's going to? Yeah. I think it's a very good question you have raised. But as you are aware, you may be aware that uh, maritime domain remains a global commons. So it becomes the responsibility of all the nations to see really how best they can protect and secure the sea lines of communication. And the protection of sea lines of communication can only help grow the global trade because two thirds of the global trade spans through this uh, sea lines of communication. So it's a responsibility of all the nations and obviously that is the fear because as you know, the South China Sea is the connecting link between the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. And that perhaps is one challenge which China has been overthrowing to the rest of the world. And this is what is being debated. And uh, international legal principles, whatever exists, obviously is not uh, liked by China. They already have disowned all the existing international legal principles. So that is the worry in geopolitics in the current context in the maritime domain. Yeah. Jim, do you have something to add? Jim Wilson? Yeah, just, just, one, just one thing. I mean, just based on my observations in the region, I think that, you know, that concern is very real and that uh, all the littoral claimant states are very, very active in boosting their own maritime domain awareness and their capabilities to respond. Uh, you know, as uh, other other folks have commented, of course, it's difficult when we're talking about PRC activities in global commons or areas outside of countries' exclusive economic zones. Um, but I think just taken together, you know, historically, there's not always been the capability among all littoral claimant states to actively monitor um, activities in their uh, uh, in their specific maritime domains, and you know, I think one practical way uh, to push back on problematic PRC behavior is just for littoral claimant states over time to develop their own capabilities to better monitor and track what's happening in their own uh, in their own areas. Can I have one sentence only? Well, blockade like deterrence takes credibility. Well, unless China has defeated the U.S. Navy in one of the following scenarios or the, either the, the large scale or, or smaller scale of conflict, I don't think it will happen because just like Jim has said, they lack the, the, the POA and lacks the credibility and capability to do that. Uh, so to your, answer your question, at the moment, there's no uniform code which is available in the South China Sea. Starting off with China first, sometime in 1992 and 98, they came up with two maritime laws, something like the border law that they, uh, you know, framed. But in the 1992 law dealt with territorial waters and zones, and 1998 dealt with exclusive economic zones and continental shelves. And that, those two laws gave them the strength to refute the permanent court of arbitration which came up with this ruling against China in terms of the James Shoal which was actually owned by, uh, by Philippines. The second part is that all the countries in South China Sea, I would say the littorals, are trying to work out a code of conduct. But that is going on for the last 10 years. 
third part is the United Nations law on the seas, you know, which is the UNCLOS, which the Chinese have ratified in 1998. But when it comes to the Americans, they recognize it, but they have not ratified it. So there's, there's a lot of problem. You know, we, we first need to come to some terms in terms of how we want the shipping to go on, and then we can proceed. So I think all countries are involved. Thank you. Uh, Air Marshal Gokhale, sir, you have, you have a final comment? Well, I think it was a wonderful mm -hmm. session. Uh, everybody has contributed to this particular topic of, uh, you know, implications of rise of China, and uh, especially in the South China Sea, where all the trade is important uh, to maintain the global common, and of course, on the unification, Taiwan. Uh, so, as uh, you know, Dr. Jaydev Randade mentioned yesterday, that if at all one odd island, you know, he would like to take it on, the Chinese would like to take it on, just to sort of please the domestic audience. Otherwise, there is going to be credibility loss for himself. So that's something which. I think, uh, you know, uh, which is important and whether with Taiwan and US together would be able to defend those one or two islands which are far off as Jim, uh, Roger mentioned. So with these concluding thoughts, uh, please give a great round of applause to all the panelists. Thank you, sir. May I request uh, Dr. Kare and Jaydev Ram? Let me, let me for, uh, formally felicitate to them. Huh? I request Jaydee Ranadi to felicitate uh, all uh, speakers. First, Professor Arvind Kumar. Professor Roger, Roger. And Air Marshal Somans. Thank you, sir. Gokhale, sir, any final comment? Anything? We are hungry now. <laughs> no, no. Please, please felicitate Jim Wilson virtually. And of course, uh, <laughs> we can offer virtually. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, one day I can join you in India. <laughs> All right. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Hare. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, thank you much. We'll have a break, uh, one hour, and we'll be starting at uh, 2 o'clock. Huh? 2 o'clock. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir.
Hello, I request everyone to have lunch and please come back at 2 p.m. Lunch is arranged for everyone.
सूप पीना है बस मेरा गला इतना खराब था पानी भी नहीं दिया पानी हेलो चालू की
Rádi. Ty kdo nohod nejde? Dobi dobi sar kvada na sajdi. Etama. थोड़ा सा रुकवा लाइए देखना Sit. All right. Right. Switch it off now. And remove it now.
Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Marshall Gokhale. I'm speaking from South Africa. I've come on a little holiday to my elder son, to younger son, sorry. The 9.15 at your time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> good morning. This is Vijay Kant, current from Kathmandu. Okay, great. Excellent. You're from the Foreign Service. Yeah, no, I'm a university teacher. In between, I joined Foreign Ministry and served as an ambassador. Yeah, I heard that. So, great. Well, I've been to Kathmandu, all right, when I was commanding Gorakhpur Air Force Station. Oh, yes. And then, uh, you know, we have this uh, Gorkha uh, recruiting yes. center and then went to Pokhara, where there's a recruiting center. And then center. other parts of that area. Lovely. But since two years, it is stopped. Since it is what? Recruitment of the Gorkha. Recruitment stopped? Yeah, stopped because of this uh, new Omnivir. government of India started an appointment. That Agni Veer. They need more, I mean, that new type of treaty or negotiation on that, I think. Oh, oh my God. Okay. Oh, I hope we are doing something. Yes, yes. It must be. Because it's a, it's a very potent force. You know? Yes. And good. It's very important force. In, and even for Nepalese, those who are working, They've got job and many things, and after retirement, all the social services schemes, and mm -hmm. creating education, health facilities, and other, and other things by the pension office of the Indian Embassy. It's sure. great help in that area. No, and uh, in Gorakhpur, I remember in hospital, they used to come in hordes, you know, so many of them, because they used to have this mainly the problem of asthma. You know, uh, during the rainy season, and they used to come for medical. When you retired, I retired uh, 15 years back as a vice chief. Oh, yes. but I continue in some different ways, engaging myself, keeping myself busy. Yeah. They're starting or what? I, well, I'm, they're supposed to start two o'clock their time, so it's now almost there. Are you giving a PowerPoint presentation? So long time ago you visited Kathmandu. I know, <laughs> yeah. How the when you visit Kathmandu, you find it's a lot of rust, traffic, new buildings, many infrastructures. Which oh, is of course. A life very difficult. <laughs> yeah, everybody wants to be in Kathmandu. How's our uh, railway line progressing? Indian railway line from uh, uh, the northern Bihar. Railway to... line uh, of the. Uh, Jayanagar Janakpur has been completed an extension to Bijalpura. It is still going on. I think in a one year or two, it, it will be complete. But there is okay. one other railway project that is from Seoul to Kathmandu. It is being studied by the Konkon Railway. So we are expecting, as uh, last time when I was participating in a uh, Good afternoon, everyone. I request all of you to come and be seated for the third session, the post-lunch session. We are going to start very soon. So there would be tunnels and all that, like what Kokan Railway has. That is China to Nepal. And that is oh. it. They are studying. Just recently they came here and they have started visibility uh, study. But I thought you said Kokan Railway. That it will take three and a half years more to complete feasibility study. Excuse me? And I don't think that it's a $1.5 billion project. 125% of Nepal's annual budget. 
Excuse me, sir. Ambassador Vijay Khan Karna. Can you hear yes. me? Can you hear yes, me, sir? Yes, madam. I'm hearing you. Okay, okay. So very soon we'll be starting the post lunch session. So in another five minutes, maybe. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. okay. Once again, I request everyone to enter the hall and be seated. We are starting the post lunch session three. So the post lunch session three, uh, we have chairperson Dr. Sheshadri Chari, speakers Mr. N. C. Bipendra, Ambassador Vijay Kankarna who will be online, and Ms. Namrata Hasija, and the discussant Professor Dr. Arun Dalvi. I hope all of you all have had your lunch and uh, yeah, please be awake <laughs> to listen to this final session. Thank you. May I request the chairperson, Dr. Sheshadi Chari, speakers, Mr. N.C. Bipindra, Ms. Namrata Hasija, to come on the dais. Thank you. I would request Professor Arvind Kumar to come as a discussant for this third session. Professor Dr. Arvind Kumar, thank you. I request the chairperson, Dr. Sheshadri Chari, to begin the session. Yeah, now it's working. Good afternoon uh, to everyone here. Uh, like uh, the earlier panels, we have a wonderful panel here this time. Uh, the subject is uh, China's influence operations in India. Now, uh, um, I'm, I'm sure uh, I have uh, come across a number of seminars on uh, China related seminars and China plus minus seminars. But this is probably the first time I'm coming across this particular subject, which is of great importance. Um, uh, we all know uh, about uh, how countries try to influence, create influence in their favor and create influence in uh, against a particular country in some other country. Uh, and uh, I mean, uh, none of uh, you here are new to things like um, United Front Work Department of the CP CCP. Uh, which is like uh, an agency meant for all these activities 
to take care of all kinds of anti uh, anti india anti enemy activity uh, all over the world and also pro china activities in different countries um, there are uh, to just give one or two examples uh, a number of uh, american movies we must have seen uh, say in the say in the early 50s 60s 70s 80s also where uh, the american uh, movie the hollywood uh, movie would elogize an american soldier or what he did or what how he saved people how he saved america and so many other things something related to world war 2 where and in in what manner the american soldier the american army the american people performed how they established democracy and so many other things but gradually uh, say from uh, late 90s and 20s early 20 uh, from 2000 to say 2015 16 there was a great metamorphosis in uh, hollywood there are number of examples i will not go i mean there are i can give you as many as 50 to 55 examples but i'll quote one film i don't know if somebody if any one of you have seen a film a, a hollywood film called pixels and uh, it was uh, produced in 2000 uh, as latest 2020 and how chinese takeover of hollywood in that film there is a scene where the great wall of china is destroyed so when the film was being the what they call the raw cut was being processed and the editing was going on the chinese authorities came to know about it and they told the producers mind you hollywood producers they said no you can't do this great wall of china cannot be destroyed even in a film sorry take it back but but the in the, the film had to do something as far as destroying a great monument has to be done so you'll be surprised instead of <laughs> great wall of china taj mahal was destroyed this is what we call the influence this was 2015 movie if i am not mistaken again another hollywood producer who was known to be sort of uh, very friendly with uh, the tibetan cause and all that that company produced another movie called kundan i don't know how many of you have heard this film heard this name none of you could have even seen this this film was based on the life of the dalai lama his holiness the dalai lama so when the chinese authorities came to know they had so much influence over the producer that they stopped not only the money for that producer they also told the world and, and, and mind you i didn't want to tell you the name the name of the producer is disney it was disney world which produced and look at the influence that the chinese exerted on disney world they said we will cancel all television license of disney world all over the world china included china is gone you can't your tv is gone from china but nowhere else in the world you can show that is the kind of pressure that they exerted and they said withdraw the film film was already produced so the disney people said we can't withdraw it but we can do one thing we will see to it that it is not released at all but they had to show to the income tax authorities that the film was made and released but it did not make any money so they showed that the film was released it was not welcomed by the audience therefore the film stands withdrawn 
this is the kind of influence that china has on hollywood so you can imagine if they can do this to hollywood what they would have done to bollywood much more than what we can we could even imagine there was a team of students from northeast universities who were invited to china and they were told to produce films short films and documentaries which will show india in a poor light and elogize the separatist movements the insurgency movements in northeast it's only after about 15 to 16 such documentaries were released that indian authorities came to know that there is a pattern behind this it's not that it is just ordinarily taking place so there are a number of overt and covert operations that china has been doing as far as creating its own influence and area of influence um the overt of course uh, includes uh, the industry it's in a very big way Uh, china's technological prowess in artificial intelligence if you are going to start a small industry and you don't have any technology to start that industry you don't have the money to start the industry bank comes a chinese company and it, if if chinese company cannot come directly from china to india then it comes to singapore it can come to come from taiwan it can for, come from south korea it can come from the us it can come from anywhere else in the world but it comes here it identifies you they give you money they give you technology so that is one way of influencing influence on media we all know there is a government of india report which clearly identifies at least three news channels which i don't want to name here which were clearly seen they they were they, they were getting billions of dollars as funding only to um, give out news items which would elogize china and show india in a bad light <clears throat> creating eminent uh, citizens group taking these such groups back to china uh, calling them for seminars and then entertaining them and then uh, youth uh, wing and then young young parliamentarian teams with, and then uh, signing mous with political parties not just with communist parties but also other parties including the ruling party the then ruling party before 2014 and also after 2014 there are uh, people from the present ruling party who have visited china on an exchange basis so this kind of a vast series of activities which are both covert and overt have been taking place so uh, it's a it's a very large subject and i know uh, the time that is at our disposal is very short and uh, i really thank the organizers especially dr professor kare for uh, giving this uh, extremely important uh, session post lunch so that nobody can miss it <laughs> i'll start with uh, maybe um, uh, mr bipindra okay uh, uh, mr nc bipindra is a journalist he is a lawyer he runs an ngo he is also editing a magazine called defense capital and he is uh, probably the only ngo in the country which has produced a very detailed documentary and uh, a report on china's influence operations in india over to you mr bipindra uh, thank you chari ji you made my job easier uh, you have almost uh, highlighted all the key points uh, which need to be uh, made known to this wonderful audience it's quite a knowledgeable audience both knowledge givers and knowledge seekers so i i, I feel that it's, it's my proud privilege to be here today to be making this presentation before i start uh, i want to thank uh, uh, jaydev ranade ji of uh, center for uh, china analysis and strategy for inviting me to this event and uh, professor kare for hosting me here in this hallowed uh, place and also namrata for facilitating my presence here today so thank you very much for this opportunity and also for recognizing the work that i have done 
uh, Chinese influence operations in India. I brought out this report, uh, two reports, one in English and one in Hindi. This is the report. I have a copy of it here right now. It's there on the screen. Uh, one was produced in 2021 and the other one was produced in 2022. One is in English, the other one is in Hindi. Uh, it's almost a translation of what is there in English. But there are some additional points that I've mentioned, additional additions that I've made to the English copy in the English, Hindi version. And uh, uh, Jaydev Ranade sir was kind enough to uh, release both these reports on two different occasions. So thank you very much sir for that. Uh, so this, this particular uh, subject is uh, quite vast, but I've been given just about 15 minutes. I prepared about 30 slides. That's about 30 seconds per slide. So, so I'll try and cover as much as possible. If, if anything is left out, probably I would recommend that you go to Law and Society Alliance's website, which is lawandsocietyalliance.in, and you can download the copy. A PDF version. I have five uh, physical copies with me here. If anybody wants a physical copy or comfortable with that, I can hand over that copy to you. So I just want to start with the very latest example of influence operations by China. Uh, I'm sure you are able to identify who this person is. He is Mr. Sridhar Bembu. He is a member of the National Security Advisory Board of India. He is an industrialist. He is the chairman of uh, Zoho Corporation, which is a SaaS company. Uh, it's one of the largest companies. Is one uh, is a billionaire. He is currently settled in Tamil Nadu after having worked in the U.S. for almost three decades, and he is trying to establish a few things uh, in rural India so that there is some kind of a skill uh, development, uh, skill enhancement, and he is recruiting people from the rural areas to become software engineers. So he's doing, doing great service. And he is also a nationalist in the sense that he's doing a lot of good work for India. He's advising the government on various uh, technological issues as part of the NSAB. Recently, there was a hit job done by Forbes magazine. I'm sure all of you have read it. Uh, all of you have, all of you know about the Forbes magazine. It's one of the most popular magazines which tracks global business and also global billionaires. Uh, it's a personal issue of Sridhar Bembu. He is uh, going through, a, he filed a divorce proceedings against his wife in the US. They utilized it to do a hit job on him, uh, you know, trying to discredit him uh, through this. Why I mention this is that this is one of the typical influence operations that uh, the Chinese adopt, not just in India, all over the world. Forbes, uh, if you, you might have you might think that it's a Western uh, produced magazine. I'm sorry to say that uh, in 2021, Forbes magazine was taken over by the Chinese. Uh, a Hong Kong based company named Magnum Opus Acquisition, which is controlled by the Communist Party of China, as China Investment Corporation took over Forbes magazine. So it is now a completely Chinese owned magazine. So why I refer to this is that uh, the Chinese, as part of their influence operations, as part of the UFW, uh, department, they keep track of very important people in India. They track journalists, they track te technologists, they, uh, they track uh, technocrats, bureaucrats, diplomats, military officers, scientists, both defense scientists, space scientists. They keep track of various programs that are very critical and strategic to India and try to do hit jobs on people whenever the opportunity arises. And they use their own magazine. Fortunately, in India, our FDI rules in the media is quite strict. So the Chinese have not been able to take over any Indian media house. But they use uh, such kind of... Uh, Forbes has a very credible name. All of you would agree uh, with this. So they use such credible names to discredit people who are working in favor of India, who are working in national interest. This is a very typical uh, influence operation that they do. And this acquisition of Forbes is a clearly a use of money power by Chinese to uh, gain influence. So if people know and track that this is a Chinese-owned media house, then they will know that there is some sinister intention behind this activity. But otherwise, generally people are not aware of such kind of influence operation, so they clearly fall for such kind of tricks that, uh, uh, that uh, the Chinese adopt. So I mentioned uh, that uh, the Chinese track 
key people in very various critical sectors. Sridhar Vimbu is a victim of such talking as far as this incident is concerned. Uh, he's, he talks in favor of the present government, so probably uh, that was one of the reasons why he was targeted. And a uh, uh, lot of political opponents of the present government targeted him for uh, being a supporter of this government. So uh, that's a very critical uh, means of which they do this operation. So in fact, in this report, I have uh, tracked about nine sectors totally. The media is one of them. I've also tracked the entertainment industry. Then uh, Indian academia, Indian media, of course, and also social media uh, club together, tech sector, and also Chinese intelligence operations in India, covert and overt operations, and trade practices, and also political setup, which uh, Sheshadri Chariji uh, typically mentioned about it. So I'll just go through one by one. Uh, okay, this is about the entertainment industry. You find some big stars sitting in an event in Beijing. This is an event that uh, took place in uh, 2019 uh, when uh, Shah Rukh Khan was invited and Kabir Khan. Kabir Khan is a filmmaker, Shah Rukh Khan is a film star. I'm sure all students would. Uh, many of them would be fans of Shah Rukh Khan, I'm sure. So this is a, one of the means by which they do influence operations. They invited these two people because they wanted to get a foothold, foothold into the entertainment industry. The Th Chinese have realized the power of the entertainment industry and the kind of impact it has on the mindset, occupying the mind space of uh, Indians, particularly the youth. So they have uh, made use of this opportunity to uh, bring these big stars to their event. and. Uh, And with this, they started uh, en entering the Indian film industry. Uh, what they, the, one of the methods that they adopt is uh, to align with an Indian production house to make films. So with the money power, they are actually able to dictate the narrative of, uh, of um, uh, the movies and also able to uh, dictate the kind of coverage that these uh, films by the, the, by the production houses that they sponsor. Uh, so, uh, in fact, uh, so this particular funding is being done by the propaganda department of the CCP. Uh, I'll just show you one more slide on uh, how this influence operation. Uh, this is a, a particular scene from a very popular song from a movie called as a rock star. Ranbir Kapoor was the hero of this uh, movie. There is a Sada Hakkarke, there is a uh, song, very popular song. So if you see in the original song, this free Tibet flag was used, free Tibet banners were used. But in the censored song, you find that free Tibet has been uh, blurred. Tibet has been blurred here. Yeah? Whereas in the same song, you will find a Khalistani flag and a Khalistani movement being openly shown. Uh, this is again a uh, the influence operation on the uh, uh, Central Board of Film Certification by the Chinese. So this is another uh, entertainment industry movie, Dangal. All of you must be knowing about it. This movie was promoted by the Chinese extensively, uh, you know, and claiming that it, it kind of uh, fetched about 500 crore worth of revenue. So again, they target the stars, they target production houses, and try to gain influence in the film industry, uh, in the entertainment industry. Similar operation is done on the television industry also in India. So I'll, I'll not go into much detail, I'll just touch upon these things. Okay, so now I'll uh, touch upon the think tanks and the civil society organizations in India. Uh, the Chinese embassy in India has been cultivating youth organizations in India uh, in a very uh, systematic manner. Uh, in you know, quite well-measured efforts, they've been cultivating a certain youth uh, from both colleges and uh, apart. They've also floated a lot of uh, youth organizations in India uh, today. Uh, the embassy provides them venue, it, it funds them, and uh, they try to do the indoctrination of the youth uh, in India. So they have floated this uh, organization called as China-India Youth Dialogue, uh, which is functioning uh, in India and sponsored completely by the embassy of uh, China. 
In fact, this particular organization has also uh, done a memorandum of understanding with the uh, All China Youth Federation. We have exchange programs and stuff like that. Huge funds uh, running into crores of rupees are spent on this particular effort. Uh, there are several think tanks, both in Delhi and uh, apart in India, which are funded by uh, uh, by this organization. We have. Uh, I am not going to name them because I am already a persona non grata in several of these places uh, because I produced this report. Uh, big, big names in the think tank industry today uh, are being sponsored by Chinese, uh, heavily funded. One big name which we were just discussing about it, uh, Raisin and Doilag hosting organization, it's also hugely funded by the Chinese embassy. Uh, in fact, how did they find out all this? Uh, I would say they were a little foolish. They had all these details in their annual report. Uh, so there, there are also typically Chinese studies think tanks. Uh, one very popular one in Delhi. Uh, after we brought out this report, we shared it with the NSA's office. After that, uh, I have heard that the funding of such, that particular Chinese uh, institute has been stopped by the by the government. Okay, so another thing that they do is they float uh, think tanks of their own. The Chinese float think tanks of their own. This is a, a foundation. They call it as foundation. It had a very typically pro-China name earlier. They changed it to Asian uh, Century Foundation. Uh, uh, after the Lata conflict in 2020, because there was a lot of backlash because of their name, and uh, they decided to change the name uh, into this. But if you go and search for it now, this is their Twitter account, it's no more functional. This is their uh, website, it's no more functional. Uh, so this is again typically uh, some of the uh, details of the big names that are how they are funded. I've just given the details here. Uh, you can go and uh, take a look at it uh, in the report here. Again, uh, another young leaders' program that the Chinese embassy has hosted. Okay, so now I'll touch upon the media a little bit. Okay, though you, this is one particular uh, advertorial. Advertorial is basically a paid for content that the media publishes in India. So they buy the pages and they publish uh, typically uh, pro-China articles. India China Chronicle is one of them. Uh, so these are, I think, uh, I'm sorry, I think it's, it's flipping, huh? Yeah, it's flipping off. Okay. So this is again produced by one particular think tank, actually, this particular India China Chronicle is produced by them. Uh, okay, now I'll look at the uh, share with you about the academia. These are all uh, China study centers and China study circles that the, that the Chinese organize, uh, typically in universities and big, big academic institutions today. Uh, In fact, uh, there are two important universities in uh, the Delhi NCR, public, uh, privately funded universities that have uh, important China study centers, Confucius Institutes. If the Confucius Institutes are not, they are not able to open such institutes, they uh, convert it into a China study center and these particular institutes are funded heavily by, by the Chinese embassy. They also encourage them to do uh, research work on China they take them on conducted tours, taken care of very well when they are in China, and uh, they come back and write glowing tributes in their in their research papers about China. Uh, this is one such institution that uh, that I'm talking about. Again, another Confucius Institute in the University of Mumbai, and interestingly, there is a Indian Institute of Management in the Northeast and an Indian Institute of Technology in South India, which have such study centers where the Chinese have big, big influence today. 
this is again about the media. Uh, Rajiv Sharma, a lot of you might know him already. He has been arrested recently for being an agent of the Chinese and providing information to, to Chinese agents, their handlers. He is arrested in behind bars. He was also the Global Times correspondent in Delhi. In fact, uh, I have known him very well for a long time because I have been a journalist before. Uh, and uh, he used to carry a lot of uh, confidential papers, classified papers with him at that time. So I used to wonder how is he getting it and uh, what is he doing with it. So later we found out that he has been arrested and for uh, being a uh, supplier of information, critical documents to the Chinese. So the other uh, Chinese influence operation on uh, media houses is that uh, you, might, you might have read about this PTI interview of the Chinese ambassador in Delhi uh, during this Ladakh conflict. How it was a, it was a plug article, uh, pro-China plug article, uh, taking stand which is uh, contrary to what the Indian government was talking about as far as the Ladakh, Ladakh conflict is concerned. Uh, so, so this is again another Chinese app which has been banned uh, in India today. Uh, this Chinese app was uh, used uh, for plugging a lot of Chinese opinions and Chinese uh, views on Ladakh conflict. This is one interesting thing that I wanted to highlight basically. Um, advertorials, content that the China publishes in the mainstream media today. This is an Hindustan Times. They have bought this a page and they have published it. This is worth crores of rupees. You know, if they want to publish in all editions of uh, Hindustan Times, it will cost them crores of rupees, a full page advertisement. This is another one uh, in the Indian Express. This was uh, published by spending crores of rupees buying space. What is the good pro quo for this? This article is the good pro quo. How China bet extreme poverty and what lessons it holds for India. This was, this article was published just 10 days after that New Indian Express, I mean, the Indian Express advertisement that China bought and spent money on. So they buy influence in the media, they influence journalists, they also conduct a, a important scholarship program uh, for journalists. They take them, uh, they conduct it for actually all South Asian nations and also some West Asian nations. They take journalists, they host them in a, in a very important uh, VIP area in, in Beijing, in a diplomatic compound. They are paid heavy sums of money uh, uh, to accommodate them there. They are given daily allowances, money they are taken on conducted tours. They are given access to, uh, to uh, the Chinese uh, government ministries and departments. Uh, and they go back and write articles which are pro-China uh, in Indian newspapers. So this is uh, something that they do. So again, another editorial piece, you know, you, know, you can't make out whether it is, uh, it is, it is uh, a Global Times article or is it a The Hindu article. So, uh, okay, social media, 50 Cent Army, I want to thank Roger for mentioning it. So 50 Cent Army is quite active. They target social media personalities. Uh, if there is anything that is against China, they try to counter it. Uh, it's a huge, huge uh, facility that the Chinese have uh, today. So this is again uh, two important journalists who are on social media. But uh, during this Ladakh conflict, if you had just noticed what, what they are uh, talking about on, in the social media handles, they are completely pro-Chinese uh, opinion. Uh, in fact, there is another journalist, unfortunately, uh, uh, some of the gentlemen are former military officers. Uh, so one of the gentlemen, if you read the reports on the Ladakh conflict written by these gentlemen, you will easily find out who has briefed them. The briefing has come from the Chinese embassy. I mean, if, if you have been a journalist for a long while, by reading a news story, you can easily make out where the briefing has happened, who has briefed them. So it, it clearly showed that uh, they were taking briefings from the Chinese embassy on the Ladakh conflict and playing up pro-China sentiments, pro-PLA sentiments. 
dissing the Indian army, saying that Indian army can't uh, stand the Chinese army for even a week's time. So these kind of articles are being written. Uh, of course, a lot of them take money uh, for doing that. I'm an insider, so I know this information. So we'll also talk about a little bit about the tech sector. Uh, these are all companies uh, in India which have been uh, uh, receiving investments from the Chinese. Uh, so this is uh, okay. This is I'm, I've, actually I've come to my almost last slides. Actually, this is the political influence that they do. Uh, the Chinese have been cultivating all communist leaning, leftist leaning uh, people in India, uh, heavily influenced, even funded. This is a meeting between the Communist Party of uh, India, Marxist top brass with the Chinese am ambassador and uh, other Chinese, uh, uh, you know, officials. So this is the chief minister of Kerala who belongs to the CPIM. In fact, uh, glowing tributes to Xi Jinping on his re-election as the president of India. And he also continues to tweet frequently on, on, on China, talking in favor of China and at times even against India. Basically, this, these kind of tweets happen because they don't like the present government. So in the name of opposing the present government, they talk ill of India ultimately. So uh, this is again a page from uh, the Rajiv Gandhi Foundation, which is run by the Congress party. So there, if there is a highlighted portion where it talks about how a team of uh, Rajiv Gandhi Foundation visited China and uh, uh, also about uh, the MOU that they signed. And also they have received funds from Chinese embassy, uh, heavy funds in crores of running into crores of rupees from the Chinese embassy. I think, I don't know if I've done it within time. Hmm? Thank you. Thank you so much. One last point I want to mention is that uh, the United Friend Works Department's influence operation, uh, they have a th three-pronged strategy that they adopt. One of the strategies called as active measures. The idea behind active measures is to utilize uh, useful idiots uh, from the host country. So that's, that's what they've been doing here. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank I you. You don't use slides. I think I've been uh, disabled because of the slides. I usually do it without them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bipindra. That was very interesting. And uh, I hope uh, uh, you are able to give uh, more copies of this and uh, we can even download the copies of this report. It's all available and we would probably be able to make one of the outcome uh, reports which we make. We will uh, give you the details of the uh, website and also the link to the report. So it's anybody can download and read it. Uh, that was a commercial break, right? <laughs> and uh, we, we, ha we have uh, uh, Ambassador Vijaykant Karna, who was former uh, Nepal ambassador to Denmark. And he's joining us online, right? Uh, Ambassador uh, Karna, you are online. Can yes. you start? Yes, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yes, please. Please go on. Thank you, Mr. Chari, the chairperson. I recall my meeting with you in 2016 in New Delhi with Prashant Jai and all. Okay, I remember. It's a pleasure to see you again. Yeah. So, uh, thank you. Uh, Chairperson, Mr. Shishadri, Dr. Shishadri Chari, my greetings and namaskar to all of you from Kathmandu. Uh, it is my pleasure to join such a group of eminent scholars, professors, and other personalities. And it is a very important and timely discussion on the rise of China and uh, its implications for the world and South Asia in particular. I am today speaking the Chinese influence in Nepal. As I told uh, Namrata that I would, and thank you, Namrata, uh, Mr. Ranadi, for organizing such a wonderful program. And again, thank you for the Department of Defense and the Strategic Studies 
Savitri Bhai Phule Pune University. So thank you very much. Uh, I would like to go in a very, have given 15 minutes to go. Uh, when I started, As Mr. Chari and uh, Mr. Deependra has discussed about many influence, and uh, Mr. Chari has made the Hollywood and Bollywood influence. It's something uh, same here in Nepal. Also. I'm telling you a little bit about that. The what is different from other countries here. So uh, let us see that uh, how the Chinese, Chinese influence engagement in Nepal started that uh, Tibet as a central pillar. After 2005, six movement in Nepal, China considerably raised its stakes in Nepal, first to promote 2008 Beijing Olympics, and then to protect Tibet security in the face of Tibetan movement in Nepal and India, time coincide with the Dalai Lama exile. And after that, when we see the timeline around mid 2013, the Chinese felt that they had more or less managed to stabilize the Tibetan issues in Nepal and began to shift focus on neighborhood policy and broader strategic interest. However, after Nepali Congress came to power in 2021, they feel that their control is slipping. Just a little bit explain about that because uh, in 2000, uh, from 1995, we have stopped Nepal government stopped issuing uh, uh, identity card to Tibetan refugee. We have a 25,000 Tibetan refugee. More than 500 Tibetan refugee yet not received any ID card at the moment. And it is the concern of US government as well as civil society of Nepal. But the Chinese influence on recently, just a few months back, our government started the process. And then Chinese has tremendous pressure on Home Ministry and the Prime Minister not to distribute that. And it has created a big problem for the Tibetan refugee in the country. They could manage to the bank, they could go to the college. Their children are, and that's a very big trouble. And in that case, they are sometimes trying to get Nepali citizenship paying bribe to the government officials. And they have managed our security forces in the border also. Uh, our police force, which uh, work as a border security force also, so that uh, they have been managed in the, our northern border. We have very few outposts in the northern areas. Which is almost six months, it is operational. Six months, nobody is in our northern border. So that's why some of the places like Humla, Chinese has increased and developed the infrastructure building also in, in Humla region. It is called the area Yari. So in 2000, October uh, 2030, Xi Jinping delivered important speech that set tone for China neighborhood policy. And China neighborhood diplomacy, which has uh, which was uh, was equipped with the two strategic goals around domestic and international condition. While China domestic policy was shaped by the goal of the 200 years struggle and the Chinese dream of great rejuvenation, and international policy was to strive for good external conditions for the China reform. So good neighborly policies they have started so many almost 19. Uh, what uh, Mr. Bipendra was telling, including on which is 19 institutions in Kathmandu being operational in two of the universities and different China study center, China friendly young youth sports related, youth organization, China Nepal, journalist organization, China Nepal, even China Nepal Tarai Journalist Association working in somewhere in Tarai. So they have, with this policy, they have developed a lot of institutional arrangement in Kathmandu and different parts of Nepal. The first and foremost 
Uh, objective of this policy was weaning Nepal off from India and Western influence. So China has been encouraging Nepal successfully to move away from Indian and Western influence in both domestic affairs and international relations by taking independent decisions. China views military assistance as one of the area for which Nepal independence from India can be achieved. So in 2020, September, I think, uh, the Chinese defense minister visited our army headquarters and he spent around six hours at the army headquarters. And uh, the next day he left. So it was a, the Chinese are trying to influence security forces in a big way, the country. And a lot of uh, offering of many things. They try to, on security, they try to make it what establishment is uh, China, sorry, India and Nepal Army. They have a relationship, a unique type of relationship where the uh, Nepalese Army Chief is a already Army Chief of Indian Army as well as the Indian Army Chief is already of the Nepalese Army. So they wanted to establish the same relations with the Nepal Army, which is dead now. So, and for this, uh, they have, uh, China has been rewarding Nepal with economic benefits, assistance whenever Nepal is a stood ground against India. Such good pro quo practices are likely to continue in the future and influence Nepal's public policy and pursuit of national interest. Another force, which is a greater influence of the China, is the leftist and communist party. So Chinese thought leftist forces is mainstay of Nepal China release. So I'm not going to the uh, history, but telling you the story from the 2017. Since late 2000, so China had been counting on the left unity to provide a stability to Nepal China relations. It overtly took initiative to reunify the political parties that had split after PM only failed attempt to dissolve the parliament in December 2020. In 2017, they make alliance and they unite the political party, two communist, major communist parties in one uh, uh, in 2018, but uh, it failed after 2021. So the main stay at the moment, the main forces, which is propagating or working in Nepal is a leftist political party. Majorly four or five political parties, those who are working, their cadres are bring tent. And I just recall in 2019, before the presidency visit to Kathmandu, the Chinese Communist Party and Nepal Communist Party has signed a MOU which allow almost many of the Central Committee, Politburo member, top leaders to visit China and get trained. And during this COVID period, they have organized several training programs to virtually they have organized. And uh, they have been uh, from uh, Persistent push for the communist coalition or communist unity. China had been pushing for the communist coalition in Nepal even after the split of the Nepal Communist Party in 2021. China push was reported during Foreign Minister Wangi visit in 2022. International Liaison Department head Liu Jinchao visit and also during the visit of Chinese speaker, uh, speaker of the People's Congress, Li Zhangzhou. So in 2021, we have a three top leaders visit to Kathmandu and they tried and talking with meeting with several communist leaders and trying to convince them to unite and make a one party. They kept continuously lobbying for the communist coalition with the tops and second rank leaders of the communist party the, through its ambassadors and other agents. The hung parliament elected by the November polls this time give way to all sorts of possibilities in government formation, and then Beijing was in favor of communist collaboration. Mao's top chairperson, Pushkamal Dahal, became the PM with the support of the largest communist party, CPNUML. This development was in favor of Beijing. However, the coalition was short-lived, 
and in February, the coalition collapsed in the context of the presidential election. Uh, then, uh, just to tell about the when President Xi visit, so he, during his visit, it was something that is a our president, prime minister, all secretaries, all joint secretaries, all top military brass were at the airport to receive him. And government asked all the government employees from Truman International Airport to all the way to Solti to be in a queue with the flower and greeting. So while he was visiting Nepal, a new blueprint for bilateral ties. It was published in a newspaper in Kathmandu. So the blueprint outlined four key elements of the strategic relationship, depending a strategic communication, broadening protocol, practical cooperation, expanding people to people exchange and enhancing security cooperation. During his visit, it was not discussed, it was not said, and the President C said that now our relation has been elevated and it's a comprehensive partnership cooperation. And it is a strategic partnership. Now the comprehensive partnership a strategic partnership cooperation for everlasting friendship. And this was declared by the presidency and it not Nepali academia or Nepal foreign ministry has discussed what is this strategic partnership. And then coming to the 2021 and 22, then is the response to MCC. We have signed the Millennium Compact Operation deal with the 500 million grants from the America for major three projects. And Chinese has, and we, the process was to ratify by the Nepalese parliament. So during and before and after, the Chinese has been in vain in Nepalese bilateral relations with the USA, and they directly said that not to ratify this, this uh, huge media influence stick due to NST, NST, American army is coming under MCC, out of fake misinformation, disinformation campaign was conducted by the Chinese officials in Nepal and distributed and managed by the Communist Party leaders and cadres. And later our in intelligence department found that one of the Chinese embassy officials was designated to do all this. <coughs> Ambassador Saab, can, can, you, can you wind up a little bit? Yeah, Another two minutes. Yeah. So uh, at the moment, uh, then come to the BRI. BRI we have signed in 2017. And they have, during the negotiation of the project implementation, they asked the proposed 4% interest rate, which Nepal government has refused, and they have single-handedly managed to the project. Nepal has proposed less than 1% interest rate and jointly managed project, which Chinese rejected it. So we have a nine project forwarded to the Chinese under BRI, but no project yet signed. So when I see this all, uh, uh, there are a huge influence, tiny influence on political parties, almost all, many political parties. Media, is influence uh, in the Nepalese media and print, online, and they have invested huge investment directly to the media on the TV, online, and many. Academics, the universities, bureaucrats. In, uh, in 2019, November, we have signed an agreement uh, with the Chinese Academy that they will train our 1,500 bureaucrats and uh, some security forces, armed police forces and Nepal police. So it has a created a, a kinds of influence in Nepal, almost in all societies and different. And there is another project which is run by the Chinese embassy that the 15 districts of mountain region 
where they bring food and other materials and directly distribute to the people in the different villages of the mountain Himalayan region. So in this way, I can say that it's a great <coughs> the moment. Thank, thank, you. thank you everyone for listening to me. Now I close. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, that was absolutely great. And uh, I hope you'll stay back if there is a question answer uh, session and yeah, yeah, there I'm could I'm be I'm questions here. for you. Uh, I would now request uh, Namrata to make her presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Chair, for giving me this opportunity. Let me take a, I know I'm the last speaker, last session, and all of you I can see, um, you know, really want the session to end, but I will not uh, uh, take a lot of time. I'll be very, um, you know, very precise in what I say, but let me just take a minute to thank my mentor, Mr. Jaydev Ranade, for giving me this opportunity. He always encourages all of us to be, you know, to be speaking and giving uh, new ideas at such conferences. And I'll thank uh, Professor Khare and also Air Marshal Gokhale, who agreed since last year to partner with the Center for China Analysis and Strategy for this very important conference. So thank you uh, for giving us this opportunity. Um, Okay, uh, so um, I'm going to speak on China's influence operations in South Asia. Uh, I know there'll be a question that why I'm wasting my time on China's influence operations in South Asia, I should focus probably on India. But I think gradually uh, as I speak, um, uh, probably I'll either, either answer this question or if I'm not able to, I'll probably try and answer it during the Q&A session. Uh, so, uh, I know it's a very informed audience, but let me, uh, for the benefit of this. Oh, here. Ah, okay. Uh, just, you know, uh, for um, the students here, I just want to, um, you know, just briefly explain, uh, you know, the influence operations. Uh, how, you know, actually the state um, plays a very important role, the Chinese state. Now, the concept of the influence operation, of course, is the United Front, which is, of course, a CCP policy that consists of eliminating internal and external enemies. That's how the concept originated, of course. And, uh, of course, controlling groups that could defy its authority, uh, constructing a collision around the party to serve its interest and projecting its influence abroad. So that is what the United Front, the concept is, that it's going to create a favorable environment for the CCP, for the Communist Party, not only, not only in China, but also abroad. Now, who are the main actors? Of course, within the party, the Propaganda Department, the United Front Work Department, the International Liaison Department, which maintains relations with foreign political parties. I think uh, the previous two speakers mentioned about it and also Professor Chari. They have 610 offices around the world. And then the Chinese Communist Youth League. And uh, within the People's Liberation Army, uh, the Strategic Support Force, public and private companies, all of us who understand China, of course, we understand that there are no private companies in China. And of course, the Ministry of State Security. Now, uh, very um, briefly, uh, you know, how they um, operate. Uh, so they use different methods. They use their diaspora, they use media, they use culture, think tanks, information manipulation, the Chinese tourist, influencers, not only TikTok, but also from the apps that are banned in China, be it Instagram, be it Facebook, Twitter, you name it. And, uh, you know, all these uh, influencers, you know, they use diplomacy, they're, of course, economy. So these are uh, different ways uh, in which they operate. Now, um, you know, uh, let me just begin by this one uh, movie. It's an animated movie. Uh, the theme is also very benign, like China portrays is itself to be a benign power, especially, you know, because we're talking about South Asia. Now, this movie, it's a uh, 2019 movie, and it's produced by DreamWorks, which is, a, of course, a US-based, uh, uh, you know, uh, production house. Now, it's a story of a teenage girl that meets a yeti on the surf roof surface, you know, on the roof of her house in Shanghai, and how she plans with the Yeti to visit the land that he belongs to. 
and uh, you know you would i mean like i said very benign subject now this movie was banned in vietnam philippines and a lot of other southeast asian countries why because very subtly through just one post you know one frame in that movie when the girl is you know the, she, this is a you know like uh, we have in our uh, bedrooms we have a poster where we put our photographs so she's put photographs of her trip to china and here they are promoting the nine dash line if you can see so this is how subtly uh, you know uh, they did it but of course uh, that's how they are building narrative not only um, in china but across the world that is why it is very important for us to understand the influence operations and also how they kind of work um and um, the next i think i'll uh, bring your notice to this um, report this is published by this is called china index now this is published by the double think lab which is um, in taiwan so they have undertaken a project to calculate how diff how much influenced are different countries uh, you know from the, uh, the chinese propaganda and uh, bangladesh is Uh, 54 in the ranking. India is 55. They have done uh, this study on 82 countries for now, uh, and they have. I think they're releasing another report where they'll they'll be covering more countries. So they have taken different parameters that uh, which sections of society in these countries are actually affected by the Chinese influence operations, and India surprisingly the three most dominant. Um, the three most dominant um, uh, areas are media military and academia and uh, you know so um, i wanted to um, is there a problem with that i it's not working yet okay so it's okay i can go on without the slides i just wanted to show you a couple of things uh, but um, okay let me uh, because uh, the ambassador has already spoken about nepal but uh, i want to just mention one thing uh, you know one institute and one study that is being funded in nepal i'll switch to bangladesh and sri lanka after this now this study is being sponsored uh, they are uh, the chinese are giving 12.7 nepalese uh, crore nepalese rupees to the center which is called china study center the mission of the center uh, okay it's here so okay the mission of the center is of course to promote uh, china nepal friendship to have a policy dialogue on china now what exactly uh, they are getting the money for so the chinese have always been troubled that why a uh, gorkhas join indian army so the study all the money is been given to this institute to actually find out why gorkhas join the indian army to study their socio economic background to basically uh, also understand from which regions they uh, come from is there only one specific region or you know um, are they are they joining it because uh, they you know they get steady income so they have had um, a couple of seminars on this already and there was also a discussion about one of the seminars on wepo where they were actually discussing and saying why can't uh, china you know subsidize these gorkhas why can't we use them for them you know why why are they going to the indian army so i'll just leave nepal here for all of you to think that this is also one of the projects that is being funded by uh, by china uh, and it's funding the funding is coming from the chinese embassy in nepal and uh, they gave them this money just before um, you know the galwan valley incident so uh, you know um, why it's very important for us also to study these a uh, narrative building or the influence operations in south asia when the galwan valley incident happened uh, we uh, at the center uh, we decided to do uh, an analysis of how the chinese are actually doing this narrative uh, building and also this uh, uh, using twitter and other accounts which are actually banned in china uh, for their propaganda so we discovered that there were a few accounts that on twitter especially which were opened around feb 2020 jan 2020 just before the conflict and usually the person who would be uh, uh, you know the the name of the person would be of course either a chinese name or something and most of them would wear that mao dress with the cap and um, that would be their profile pic 
and they all became active around April 2020, May 2020, when the Galwan Valley incident ha actually happened. They started targeting our army, they started targeting our prime minister, national security advisors, direct personal attacks, and also uh, writing many things about our Indian army, which I don't want to mention here. And uh, there was also a video, which still kind of comes back to me every time when I study, um, you know, try to study influence operations. There was a video where they show that uh, Prime Minister Modi and Xi Jinping are fighting with their boxing gloves. And uh, suddenly Pakistan joins uh, Xi Jinping. And uh, then Nepal joins Xi Jinping. And India gets a little worried because Bangladesh is the only one that is with us. Then uh, Maldives joins, uh, you know, Xi Jinping, and um, all the other South Asian countries join Xi Jinping. Um, then Bangladesh sees this, and Bangladesh also runs and joins Xi Jinping, and uh, then all of them run after uh, Prime Minister Modi. Now, you, we can say wishful thinking, of course it is, but that's what they're working for when they have their influence operations in South Asia to change the narrative, to build a narrative that is positive for China. Now, um, because I said I'm not going to take much time on Nepal, I'll actually switch to this slide, which where you can see um, partnerships that they have with different Sri Lankan uh, think tanks, universities. So uh, this is very important here because Indian Ocean has always uh, been, uh, you know, if I can use the word here, bugging the Chinese. Now, so what they have done is that one project I want to mention here, which is China Sri Lanka Joint Center for between the University of uh, Ruhuna and the South China Sea Institute of Ocean uh, Oceanology in Guangzhou, uh, China. This is under the Chinese Academy of Sciences, and they are doing joint research projects in marine science education and research in the Indian Ocean. Uh, this was signed during Xi Jinping's visit in 2014, and the project is part of Chinese efforts to build an underwater surveillance network in Indian Ocean and South China Sea to track the, vehicle, uh, the vessels. Now, the research through this center is therefore very strategically important, uh, you know, to tap with the University of Ruhuna's uh, centers and capabilities. It is part of China's efforts uh, to build global uh, underwater uh, surveillance uh, uh, system since 2018 onwards. So the officials from Chinese, China's MOFA and most both have visited the center. The center's, uh, you know, uh, main people have visited China many times. It's a very healthy exchange, if I may call. And this um, project especially has got a lot of funding from the Chinese. So this is another, uh, you know, uh, important uh, uh, operations that the Chinese are doing, um, you know, in our neighborhood. Then uh, there are many think tanks, and of course, uh, education is being uh, already, I think, Bipin Rusor and um, Ambassador have mentioned that the Chinese have been using education as a tool. The students are here, so let me spell it out. It's very uh, important for us to look at the Confucius Institutes that are set up around South Asia be it Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, be it Nepal. And when the Con uh, Confucius Institutes are center, they open the China study centers. So you will see that probably uh, Bangladesh also has just two uh, Confucius Institutes and Nepal also has just two. But with the, uh, what the work is, then after the um, Confucius Institutes are established, they open China study centers. And they open uh, China centers, uh, China study centers across uh, you know, the country, and they are doing a lot when it comes to the influence operations, because they are influencing young minds. And uh, most of them, they, they give scholarships to students and to study their undergraduation, to do their post-graduation, PhDs, short-term programs, long-term uh, scholarships. Not only students, they're also targeting different sections. The politicians are given uh, you know, these exchange programs, as they call uh, civil servants in Nepal, in Bangladesh, in Sri Lanka, I found that uh, most of many of these uh, scholarships are actually going to the civil servants, to politicians, to academicians, to people from think tank, journalists. So they have not left any section that is untouched. And this is one of... Uh, Okay. So they are also opening few Belt and Road Institutes. This is one in Sri Lanka. And uh, 
uh, they are uh, uh, publishing reports that are of course pro uh, BRI and they're building a narrative how B how much BRI is actually important uh, for their own economic development. This is another one in Sri Lanka and the same is happening in uh, Bangladesh. In fact, I would want to mention this. Uh, this project was started by Huawei in Bangladesh and they gave uh, tablets to students during COVID time so that they can study at home. A very nice gesture, but all these tabs were preloaded with apps, with internet. And uh, when you're using Chinese apps, they show things the way they want to. Like even in India, uh, Xiaomi, and uh, in all these places, Xiaomi shows India's map without, uh, you know, Ladakh, without Arunachal Pradesh. So uh, these apps, uh, you know, which are preloaded are also, you know, playing their part in the influence operations. In Bangladesh, one more thing which is different from Nepal and Sri Lanka is that Huawei and ZTE are very active. They are the ones who are actually giving scholarships. They're also building e-villages in and around Dhaka and Chittagong. Both Chittagong, of course, is very important uh, port for them. So they are building, uh, you know, e-commerce, um, uh, e-villages -E around these uh, places where, of course, um, it's Huawei and ZTE that are promoting. In Bangladesh, again, uh, like I said, uh, these, there are think tanks that are purely funded by the uh, Chinese and they are publishing reports that are pro-China, pro-BRI to build a narrative uh, around this. And in fact, uh, many of them have Chinese um, as their directors, as their on their advisory boards. And then uh, lastly, just to conclude, I'll also, uh, you know, talk about these friendship associations. We, of course, have it in India also, India-China Friendship Association. These association, friendship associations are in Nepal, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, and their presidents or the people who run these um, friendship associations, of course, are very influential. I'm showing you an example of the China Bangladesh, Bangladesh uh, Friendship Center. The president of this uh, center, Kuo Pe, uh, Lin, he has contacts with all the top army officials, all the businessmen, politicians in, Bang uh, in uh, Bangladesh, and they're invited, of course, for iftar parties, for good, uh, uh, lavish, uh, you know, receptions. <coughs> so, uh, you know, these are, of course, uh, ways that China is building their influence um, uh, around the, you know, South Asia. And I think um, I'm not going to give any conclusion or policy recommendations because I don't want to do that. But I would like to say at least one step we have taken today is by talking about influence operations so that people become more sensitive and more aware about what the Chinese are doing. And I think this should become part of, you know, our discourse where we discuss this and uh, talk about it so that, it, you know, all of us understand what these operations are and how the Chinese operate, because um, it looks benign, but trust me, it is not. Thank you. I'll just conclude here. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. I agree that every speaker requires more time because of the intensity and seriousness of the subject. Uh, over to you, Professor Arvind Kumar. Let me, uh, at the outset, compliment uh, both uh, Mr. Vipendra and uh, Ms. Ramada for really coming out with such very interesting observations through their studies. But let me tell you that for a nation such as China, which has the ambition to be or to become a global power, and obviously has the ambition to remain unipolar in Asia in a multipolar world. Obviously requires these many exercises to be conducted. I think we have to also consider the operations which CIA had done, KGB had done. During the decade of 50s and 60s, they were both covert and overt operations being done by, being manned by both KGB and CIA. Why? Because the US wanted to remain supreme, preeminent in terms of having all the intelligence gathering mechanism with them, as well as maintaining surveillance across the globe 24-7 and reconnaissance, spying through satellite. Unless a country improves its ISR capability by whatever mechanism a country wants to do, that country's ambition, if at all they have, to emerge as a global power that will never be attained. So if China has been penetrating to India's system, I think it is nothing new 
we shall not be surprised technically i think how quickly we shall get penetrated ourselves to chinese system should be our priority and a strategy because that is something which could really impede china's way of doing things china has penetrated across the globe through the confucius institute and perhaps the academic institution finds a safe haven for many of these countries to really get penetrated at least to start with i remember a lot of these debates which happened in fact in fact uh, the ford foundation the way they had established their office in delhi and the idea was that how best through ford foundation they can come to know about india's plans india's maneuvering what india's policies could be so i think china is very much on the horizon china wants to enhance its capabilities in intelligence information gathering mechanism i think the right person to talk about that is uh, mr jadev rana de himself and surveillance how china has come up in a big way i think if you see one of these development which china has uh, been coming in a big way in outer space and i think these are some of the small things which are, they are doing their penetration to india system and india is all aware about these many things only thing which we have to do is that how quickly we can also evolve a strategy and mechanism to counter china's nefarious design that is one thing the second thing in fact as far as many of these issues which are obviously uh, uh, shared by both the speakers here i think there are a lot of rules and regulations like confucius ensured establishment is not that easy in india if someone has established is against india's law because i remember in fact uh, chinese had approached me in particular i was heading a department at manipal university department of geopolitics and international relations they wanted to start a confucius institute there i said no it's not possible because we have to take clearance from ministry of home so i think most of these things which again are being done despite all these regulations it seems that weaknesses are with us not with china so china has come to know about many of the things i'm sure that they would like to see that how they could really be able to infer what is india's intentions what is india's behavioral patterns what is india's fundamental goals through these exercises their number of uh, scholars coming uh, to india again is something which we need to understand that how the thing has happened there is a china town in bangalore lot of these collaborations which we are doing especially in the software area i think is obviously uh, making us vulnerable so these are some of these challenges obviously will keep coming and how best one can counter the challenges in a manner where india's overall national security is not obviously uh, uh, hurt and that is something which we need to uh, take into account more importantly uh, most of these actions undertaken by china not only in india their behavioral pattern getting reflected across the globe that is noteworthy do you know if you see their penetration in africa they really know the pulse of average african what african wants and accordingly they will invest okay they want a stadium so in fact they will construct a stadium for them so this is the way they have been really running their show in the in, in the form of realizing their goals and obviously seeing that how they fulfill to their aspirations of becoming a, a global power but i think becoming a global power is not only that one becomes a global power what they will do after they become a global power i think that is more important will they be able to assume the responsibility to lead the world affairs no simply no because their behavioral pattern is such which could certainly be seen as highly intimidating there was a survey done among all the nations in southeast asia all the 10 nations asian nations whether they would really uh, would like to work with china or continue working with china or they would like to develop certain long term relations with india in fact all of them in one go have given voting to india that they would really they see china as an intimidating power they don't want to work with china anymore but there is a compulsion as you know the volume of trade between asean and china is uh, almost uh, five times than uh, the volume of trade between india and asean so i think these are some of these uh, issues which again become very important geopolitically and china's maneuvering in terms of uh, uh, their uh, uh, promoting their interest is something which is completely different i don't think that india will ever be able to uh, in fact uh, create its sphere of influence in uh, chinese territory it will attempt in fact a lot of these debates which happened that now india has been encircled by china in many ways and uh, the, the china basically has been attempting to impede india's progress and the uh, chinese basically started arguing no 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 it's not that we are doing india itself is encircling china and india has done very little in central asia and because those developments which india has done in the last few years these are seen to be a part of uh, uh, examples by china giving to the world so china's ascendancy in terms of uh, its uh, economic uh, growth china's ascendancy in terms of its geopolitical role china's ascendancy in terms of its larger uh, in fact uh, bilaterals with the rest of the world is something which is going to be continuing 
and obviously we have to be extra cautious and careful. So these are study, these are studies really have made us aware in a big way that how they really have been penetrating and how that is going to be detrimental to the larger interest of India because it's not that easy. We have to take it seriously. And obviously people in the system should take it seriously to really come up with certain good, coherent, strategic plan to deal with these type of challenges. Otherwise, what will happen? That our national security obviously will uh, be completely uh, seen as a part of the, uh, in fact, uh, problem. In, a, in fact, last sentence, I want to say that China in due course, in fact, in the global, at a global scale, China will emerge as a part of the problem for the international system. China certainly will not be a part of the solution. But India in due course, obviously the way India has been unfolding, India will emerge as a part of the solution, not as a part of the problem. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Arvind Kumar. Uh, uh, I, I find that uh, we are supposed to end in another three and a half minutes. So, we, uh, we can take uh, a set of two or three questions probably. Yeah. And short quest questions and no guarantee for answers. <laughs> Thank you. This is not a question. This is a suggestion made to Mr. Bipendra and Namrata. Can you please share your findings, your reports in regional languages in India, if you really want people to be aware, not just in Hindi, in all the regional languages? Thank you. Thank you. Very good suggestion. Yeah. Seminars like these give you an impression that Chinese are seven and a half feet tall. They are not. You talked about influence operation, but if Indians are susceptible to influence operations, so are the Chinese. The Chinese infiltrate into our print media, into our electronic media, into our social media, and we are not able to do that to them because we can't infiltrate into their area. But they also have their weaknesses in the sense that four to five crore Chinese come out of China as tourists. A lot of Chinese come out for economic uh, aspects. So there are about seven, eight crores or 10 crores of Chinese floating outside China and they're willing to talk to you on anything. We can use their social accounts, social media accounts, print media accounts to infiltrate into them and also give them a test of their own medicine because when Galwan happened, there was a trend on social media, especially the ex-servicemen of Chinese. They were worried. The Chinese soldiers were buried without any national honor while the Indian soldiers who were martyred in that got the full due recognition from, uh, from our country. So they are susceptible. Mm -hmm. Think of offensive operations, offensive influence operations. Yeah. You wanted to... Thank you for such a lovely session. Uh, I'm personally very fond of studying influence operations. Uh, so, you know, with organizations like the Red Foxtrot Group, which conducted the Red Foxtrot Group, which conducted uh, various things, such as attacking the telecom, like you rightly said, I don't, I'm not interested in knowing how we can, you know, do that back to them, but I'm more interested in knowing what are the ways in which we can defend the data and privacy of citizens in the state. And especially because right now, the way they have worked on their AI programs is very scary in terms of getting uh, deep fakes and having, uh, you know, images of political leaders being shown for their agenda and all of that. So first to your suggestion, sir, uh, uh, in fact, uh, Hindi we brought out, we intend to bring it out in other languages also, but you do know that uh, publications are a very costly affair and we have very limited resources. Absolutely, sir, that can be done, sir. Uh, that is one thing, sir, and uh, to your question, sir, uh, to your remarks, I think we can uh, do counter operations, influence operations, but uh, what is my understanding of this issue is that within China, we are not able to do it because of the kind of government that they have and the kind of uh, strict, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the controls that they have over the Chinese population at this point in time. But we can do it in other places. 
that will also fall under the category of covert operations. I will not elaborate on this at this point in time. You understand as a military officer. Uh, so uh, the third question, uh, I mean, I didn't really get your question. I'm sorry uh, about it. But one thing I want to respond. Last time you asked about Fox, Foxcom Chennai uh, thing. I just want to tell you in connected to this influence operation. I hope you remember in 2021 December, there was a huge protest that happened in that facility because of which it was closed down. That is again an influence operation. The influence was on the, uh, the labor union that was there, which is a communist union. So it was, it was uh, intended to disrupt operations there so that Apple moves out of India from that facility. So just. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you are absolutely right, sir. There were, what he's saying is that two hours after the protest, there was an article in Global Times stating that the supply chains and the production of uh, facilities from China should not be moved out of China because of all these troubles that the new places have. So this is a uh, you know clear-cut uh, influence operation that they do. Uh, in fact, uh, I will borrow from Professor Rogers' comments. Sun Tzu's is, uh, rotting the nation from within that's the idea this is a small example just look at it in the larger you know uh, larger uh, perspective so if if there are totally completely influenced youth who are today's students are today's citizens not tomorrow citizens so if they are influenced what is going to be the outcome say 10 years from now 20 years from now China will be dominating India and we won't be able to do anything because most of our brains would have been completely whitewashed in favor of China. Um, thank you. I think uh, in the interest of uh, uh, finishing this session on time, I will have to stop it here. Uh, I should, I will thank uh, my panelists, uh, Dr. Mr. Bipindra, uh, Ambassador Vijaykant uh, Karna, uh, Madam Namrata Hasija and uh, Professor uh, Arvind Kumar for excellent interventions. Of course, as Ms. Professor Arvind Kumar said, that uh, CAA has done it, KGB has done it, Mossad has done it, so many other countries have done it. And probably if you go to some other country, um, they would say even India has done it, uh, RAW has done it. I'm sorry if there is any RAW officer here, I seek his pardon. Uh, but there have been incidents uh, like this, but uh, there is a principle in economics, caveat emptor, buyer beware. It is we who have to be very careful, we have to be aware of all these things. And the very important, uh, the message of this session or the importance of this session was to highlight this subject, which as I said in earlier in my opening comments, that I have attended a number of seminars on China and China related seminars also, but nowhere such subjects have been brought into discussed at length and made public. So I think it's very important as Namrata very rightly mentioned, it's very important for us to discuss this subject also and it should be an eye opener for the, uh, not only for the students, not only for the academicians, not only for the general public, but also these probably could become a suggestive act, uh, action, uh, uh, report for action. Uh, as far as the government is concerned, we should be able to come out with certain strong proposals and suggestions for the governments to act. So I will end this session here. Thank you very much. Uh, may I request Dr. Vijay Khari, sir, to felicitate the panelists. Chairperson, Dr. Sheshadri Chari. <laughs> Speakers, Mr. N. C. Bipindra.
मिस नम्रता हसीजा मिस नम्रता हसीजा Thank you, sir. A bouquet for the discussant, Professor Arvind Kumar. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thanks to Ambassador Sarna. Uh, I'm offering bouquet online. Please accept it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next. May I now call thank upon Ms. Mr. Jaydev Ranade, President, Center for China Analysis and Strategy, to propose a vote of thanks. Uh, it's left me, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to thank you all for being here. I see that um, the conference, if I may make my own inference, uh, has not been uninteresting because I find the majority of the people still here, despite a very good lunch that has been served to us. Um, I hope you found the conference interesting. Uh, we only touched the tip of the iceberg really, but uh, since the last session did evoke some interest, I'd like to make two points clear. Firstly, it's been done to sensitize to you what activities an enemical nation is carrying out within India. It's not a question of trying to show that some country is doing it, another country is not doing it. Every country does it. It depends on how successfully do you, they do it. And if you just look at yourselves, you realize that many of us watch American movies, wear blue jeans, etc. That's a successful cultural influence. And that's a successful operation. So the Chinese have a long way to go. But uh, the idea is just to sensitize uh, all of you as to what's happening. And as far as the conference itself is concerned, I hope we've uh, indicated to you uh, what the contours of China's plans are, what its strategy is, and uh, I hope we can continue this not only through the next uh, session, which may be planned for next year, but even in between, if we can have more focused discussion on China's uh, methodologies and its systems. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, let me thanks on behalf of the Department of Defense and Strategic Studies and Center for China Analysis and St Strategy. Uh, last year, if you recall my word, I said that uh, in a concluding session, very soon we'll have it a uh, big conference on fall of China and its implication of the world. We will wait. Uh, uh, if you look at the fault line of China, there are 22 indicators that has already emerged on global security environment. And we need to understand in that uh, fault line. And very soon we can identify that fault line and then we can come out with the uh, new kind of argument, how we could talk about fall of China or uh, influence of the global power politics. In fact, while uh, discussing this uh, two days conference with uh, our respected Jaydeji Ranade, we just uh, very hurriedly made it uh, uh, this program. In fact, uh, we were planning in the month of April, but some, somehow we could manage in the March. And there are two things, two 
two or three things we need to update and we are thinking to uh, add in the next st third strategic dialogue that would be one important part is how china is influencing international institution and the morning session one expert uh, highlighted that how uh, china is influencing global power in particularly international institution so that would be one area we could explore in next uh, strategic dialogue third would be a technology transfer and uh, a role of uh, uh, chinese technology particularly uh, that would be uh, one we can be add and for the student and uh, those who are the rsp the working on china for them uh, we are thinking that uh, we could have a, a, a essay competition uh, among the student and those we identified the good paper and uh, those who are the winners they will be part of presentation there will be you know that would be will a uh, token of amount will allow announce and uh, good paper on china uh, we could give a uh, prize for them so uh, with this background uh, once again i thanks to all my uh, faculty staff department uh, uh, non teaching staff uh, uh, staff from dr ambedkar studies staff from international center staff from uh, defense and strategic studies uh, i thanks to my all authorities particularly honorable vice chancellor pro vice chancellor registrar and all authorities uh, uh, they extended all kind of support uh, to organize such a important event uh, i thanks to uh, honorable uh, respected jaydeep ranadu ji and uh, namrata ji uh, over phone we would, we could manage everything and we did, it was very short period but uh, whatever i said sir we could manage this way they said okay go ahead and uh, due to their cons constant support we could come out with this uh, two day successful seminar i'm also thanks to uh, all my est staff and uh, electronic and print media representative they have covered extensively estates program and even today's program uh, this is the only program we have telecast uh, to the all affiliated colleges and more than 2 lakh student uh, is seeing this program the beauty of the the strategic dialogue uh, i use it my that power being the dean of the faculty i made it uh, one circular that uh, it is compulsory to particular social science student they are watching uh, this event so this would be again important event and in third strategic dialogue we could uh, come out with a new idea and those student would want to uh, research do the research on china they can directly communicate with the jaydeep ranade or to the department so we can develop another windows for the new generation and that is the idea basically uh, it's what uh, we have idea that uh, uh, we can develop a infrastructure but we cannot develop a human capital and uh, to develop human capital you need a time so the academic institution has to play important role to come out with the good human capital infrastructure we can create within a, a time bound period but you cannot create a human capital and this new generation are a important strategic uh, uh, capital for us and we need to train them and that is the purpose uh, to, to having a, such kind of dialogue in university campus so once again i thanks to all uh, panelists all mem uh discussant all participants online offline and all authorities of the both uh, institution uh, on behalf of uh, university once again i thanks to each one now tea is ready uh, have a discussion to particular students they might not uh, ask few questions to the expert but now we have a time for uh, during the cup of tea you can ask the question to the expert thank you thank you very much thank you thank you sirs thank you a small announcement one of our students has lost his pen drive during lunch time so just in case somebody has come across it could you please hand it over here i repeat again one of our students has lost his pen drive during 